I'm just gonna go ahead and import a graphic real quick before we start. We're not gonna use it right away, but I want it to be ready. So graphics, grab this. Oh, actually, grab both of these. Dun, dun, drop you in there. There we go. So that's gonna go ahead and import that graphic. So this is just a, uh, a little sprite sheet that we're gonna use later on for some easy peasy graphics and save some stuff. Um, you've done it once by accident? That would be nuts. Programming Comic Sans. It's kind of sense. Is it? It might actually be fixed with. I'm not sure. Anyway, all right. So what we're going to make today is effectively a Pac-Man clone. Um, the reason for this is the most important thing in programming is asking questions, asking the correct questions. Um, and the first question is, well, what are we making? And it seems like, you know, kind of a silly question or maybe like a Zen thought experiment or something like that. Um, but it's incredibly telling because the single most important thing in programming is before you sit down to program, you should know what you're making. Um, and typically that would mean making a design document. Theoretically, you know, even if you don't necessarily have to have everything in there. But the ideal is I, I say something like, hey, draw on paper just with a, just with a pencil, draw a preview of what your screen or screens will look like. Simply by virtue of drawing out an example screen, you figure out so much about um, there's so many implications about how your program is going to run, how it shouldn't, how the user should interact with it, and you start to figure out some rules. Um, or you know, figure it out like you can almost like on paper figure out like what one sequence of turn will be, what will be the primary game loop, what is the player going to do, what is going to happen when they do it, and and that sort of feedback loop. And you really should have all that planned out. Um, just sitting there and starting to write a program is like trying to write, uh, you know, a, a seven part epic novel series, literally starting from chapter one and then just writing nonstop. You don't do that, right? You have certain ideas, certain big scenes, certain plot developments, and then you might you might lay out a few scenes ahead of time and then be like, okay, how do we get from, you know, point D to point E kind of thing along the way? Um, and you don't have to have literally everything solved, but it's important. Anyway, all that to say, the number one advice I always say when people are trying to learn game programming for the first time is clone an existing game because you already have a complete design document for that game in another game that already exists in there. Um, can you get a hold? Of, oh, you're gonna follow along as you've done it. Uh, yeah, if I, um, hang on, if I pop open, I think I just have a link in here. Why's my computer being so slow? Uh, I think, let me just check this link is still working because I actually started working on this a while ago. Yeah, um, so you can grab the sprite sheet right over there if you if you literally want to follow along while we stream over here so by working from an existing game and i would say like make pong make pac-man make breakout breakouts a, a really common initial one to do um you already know what the game is supposed to look like so then every step along the way mostly becomes well how do i do this thing i know exactly what the thing is because most novice programs like how do i do a thing well what 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 thing are you talking about well something kind of like this well no you need to be specific so we're gonna kind of make a pac-man clone and the advantage of doing this is we're going to learn a few very, very basic things and also try to think like an old school programmer. It means we don't have to really concern ourselves with some of the stuff that Unity in and of itself brings. We are going to use some of the Unity library in particular. We're going to use tile maps uh, because it's a really convenient way to lay out some things. But we don't have to think too much about physics and weird interactions like that. And not too much in the way of complex um, complex math and things. Now, I'm not background encoding. It's, there's nothing running on my computer. It's just, I don't know, Explorer is being really unresponsive for some reason. Um, so yeah, when we think of Pac-Man, we think, or, or Puck-Man, the story of the intrepid Zamboni driver trying to collect all of the pucks on the, in this, in, in the, in, in the arena, um, while he's being chased by goalies, legally distinct to Pac-Man, um, when we think of that, we know there's going to be some sort of maze, we need a player who can move around the maze, Interact with something in the haunted arena. I like that. Interact with something, the 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 power pellets or the pucks. Um, well, actually, what are the names? You've got you've got the dots that you know what? I don't want this. You've got the dots that Pac-Man picks up that he needs to pick up all of the dots to complete the map. And then you've got the big ones. I think the big ones are called power pellets, right? The ones that make the goal ghosts be scared and try to run away. What are the actual are they just pellets, pellets and power pellets? And then we've got fruit that show up sometimes for bonus points, although I don't think you need to pick them up to complete the, uh, the game. So there's those three kind of objects that Pac-Man interacts with, which are effectively work basically the same way. Pac-Man runs into them, 
you get some points, the exception being the power pellets, which activates some sort of power mode. Um, and then in addition to that, you have the goalies, who are another object that it works like Pac-Man. These are both types of objects that move around in this maze. One moves based on user input, the other moves on some sort of extremely rudimentary AI. Um, it is kind of interesting. All of the ghosts in Pac-Man do work slightly differently. Uh, there's one that's completely random. There's one that always tries to turn towards Pac-Man. There's, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's some rules for the various ghosts, uh, which is interesting. They're actually even deterministic. Uh, theoretically, you can perfect each map um, with a particular set of income uh, inputs. Pac-Man is like that. I don't know if Ms. Pac-Man is the same. Ms. Pac-Man might have some actual randomness. I'm not sure. And yes, Fageva brings up the, uh, the story here. Puck-Man was originally going to be the name of Pac-Man because of the name he makes, Bucka 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 Bucka, which I think is a, like, Japanese, like, I don't know if it's an onomatopoeia or, or something like that, like, for, for eating sounds, like, right? We'd say, like, nom 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 or something like that, but it'd be Bucka 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 kind of thing for uh, for Pac-Man. Obviously, that's the sound he makes. Uh, but someone pointed out at some point that it would be pretty easy to vandalize the name Puck-Man into something somewhat rude. Hence, Pac-Man. Paku, is that it? Okay. Something like that. Like, vaguely knew the story. Um, all right, so we've got some elements that we figured out, right? We need some sort of maze, and we need we need something that can move around the maze. Let's start with that. Now, how do we implement the maze? If we're thinking about this super old school, the maze would almost certainly be implemented as some sort of two-dimensional array, or an array of array, or, you know, an offset array, or, you know, however the implementation happens. Um, very simply, with probably zeros and ones. It's probably a bit map that indicates whether there's a wall or whether there's not a wall. That's pretty much it. Um, and in terms of data storing, that's the ideal way of doing it. Really, you just need an array of zeros and ones that indicate where there's a wall or not, and that's how you would save it. In terms of how we would implement it today, what you might do is actually have, you might have a graphic. You might be able to open up, you know, Photoshop or whatever, and just draw pixels for when you want the maze parts or not maze parts or anything like that. Now, that's the question of how you would store and load level information. We won't have to necessarily concern with, all, with that because we're just going to make a single level. Um, I mean, we could make more than one, but it's going to be implemented inside of Unity as Unity game objects. You could absolutely build a loader that loads from that or from a JSON file or whatever your data source might want to be, or you'll just create them all as game objects inside of Unity. Everything is fine. Um, because the maze is effectively, you can think of the maze as simply a series of squares, either an empty square where the, the maze movers can move, or a full square which represents a wall where you can't move, and that's it. We're going to use Unity's tile map system because it's very easy for us to draw with. Um, there's no reason we have to use this. We could roll our own, we could do all kinds of things, but that doesn't seem to be much point in doing that. It seems like using Unity's built-in tile mapping system is the way to go. So what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and get started with that. Now, um, what's funny is that different versions of Unity keep changing things on me in terms of do we need to import things or not. So there may be a couple places along the way where I'm like, wait, hold on, how come I don't have access to Foo? Oh, it's because I have to import some sort of package. Um, it's very much a moving target in terms of what Unity decides to include by default versus what you need to go ahead and import on something. Um, but we'll go ahead and create a tile map. So by right-clicking the hierarchy here under two 2D objects, you can create a tile map in here and we'll just put it in our scene. So by default, this makes a grid object and then the tile map itself. Uh, and you can have multiple tile maps in here. And a tile map is just a very, very simple structure that allows you to place tiles, i.e. graphics, on a grid. And that's really what it's there for. Obviously, we can go ahead and put a sprite wherever, whenever we want, uh, really simply, but it will be much easier if it's on a fixed grid because it's just going to be way less frustrating to draw. Now, in the sprite sheet that I've grabbed, this thing is a collection of a bunch, a bunch of little individual images. Um, and we're going to use one of these as, as our drawing. Now, if we go and open this, first of all, this sprite sheet, you can, all your sprites could be individual little image files, or in here, it's a single sheet that's got a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot of different images. Um, there is an advantage to using a single graphic with a lot of images in that there is literally just one graphic file. The one graphic file can be loaded onto your video card one time. And then from then on, whenever you're drawing one of the individual sprites on here, really you're just telling the graphic card to draw a particular section of this one graphic. Now, as it turns out, when you're working with tile sheets and things like this in Unity, um, often it will do some smart things. It will create its own um, 
uh, atlases out of sprites and things like that, and there's a lot of different manual control. We're not going to go into any of that kind of jazz, but it's quite nice to work with a sprite sheet. Sometimes it's less convenient because it's one file and you've got to break it up, and sometimes it's more convenient, um, but in this case, we're going to go ahead with this one. Now, what you have to do if you're working with one image that is multiple sprites, you have to change the sprite mode over here. And again, if you were working your project set in 3D mode, by default, this would have been imported as default, which i.e. would be a plain vanilla texture meant for texturing a 3D object. But instead, we want this to be on sprite mode for 2D and for UI work. Um, and that will just, it just sets certain defaults. It uses a different shader by, by default. Um, and it's uh, and it's well set up for us to be breaking it apart into itty bitty pieces. If you do have any questions, absolutely like feel free to ask along the way. I may be able to address them now. I may try to remember them for later, or I might just ignore you because I'm bad at noting things. So we're gonna change the sprite mode here to multiple. And what this does is it says, it gives us the ability to slice this up into a bunch of individual sprites. Because in here, in our asset folder, there's the main file listed in the assets here, which represents the actual .png or GIF or JPEG or whatever this is. It's, I think it's PNG. Um, and then within it is sort of the sprite that will actually get used by Unity. Um, and if you have it on single, then you've just got the one. If you've got it on multiple, then what all of a sudden happens in the sprite editor, we can take this bad boy and specify, we can zoom in with the mouse wheel, we can specify that each one of these little sub chunks, it's its own little graphic. Now you can go and slice it uh, automatically. Automatically will work fine if it's a bunch of little images on a transparent background and it will just try to detect individual like, you know, sprites, individual images and put a little slice right around those little things. Sometimes it works well, sometimes it doesn't. In this case, what we could absolutely do is cut it based on a cell size. If we know what size each one of these cells is, um, we can do an automatic slicing. So let's let's say this might be probably something like 16 by 16. Now this won't work quite right here. You can see like you can can you just barely see the white lines of the grid? To me, it looks like it's about the same si the right size, but it's not in the right position. Um, actually, it is too small. Apparently, that's weird. Often, most people work with sprites that are powers of two, 16 by 16, 32 by 32, um, that sort of thing. Sort of a throwback to some old optimization video cards want power of two textures and things. Um, you don't have to be as explicit about it now because, um, well, first of all, the the 30 the, the power of two texture to be interested in is this whole sheet now. Um, and most uh, of your graphic programs will automatically add a little bit of padding um, to make it a power of two sort of invisibly behind the scenes. Although every now and again, it will lead to some wonky behavior if you're not expecting it. So um, we'd have to know exactly what size this is. Not only that, but there's a little bit of padding between each one of these on this particular sprite sheet. These like two pixel thick, it looks like green lines between each one of these. So if we want to do a bulk slice, we'd have to figure that all out. What I think we're gonna, I'm gonna do here is instead of using any of this sort of automated slicing tools, I'm just gonna go ahead and do it by hand. So I'm gonna go and revert this. And all I'm gonna do to start off with is I'm gonna draw a square here. So what I've just defined is an area here, there we can confirm, it's 20 pixels by 20 pixels. I'm defining some sort of sprite here. Um, and this is gonna be, in the end, sort of a, our wall piece that's sort of in a crossroads. But I'm only gonna define the one sprite right now, and we'll just use this to start off with. We'll make it prettier later on. Um, but call let's call this wall center. Wall, I mean, you could number them. Um, you know, clarity is the most important thing. It's, it's a wall with a neighbor to the north, east, south, and west. Maybe we wanna think about that. You know, that's not bad, because to the north, to the east, to the south, to the west, there's a neighbor. And maybe we can use that as our convention for our walls, right? So if this one's that, um, and then we drew another one, say this guy over here, for example, this would be a wall that only has a neighbor to the north and the west. At some point, when you apply this, in your project folder over here, you can see our sprites. So this is the sprite file right here, but within it, there, or this is the graphic file, but in terms of the actual sprites that we're gonna be using for our 2D work, whether we're talking about um, regular 2D art or a user interface element, um, these are the little individual bits we're gonna use. This is also what we're gonna use for the tiling system. When you're working with 2D sprites, see how there's some fuzziness over here, right along the edge? I don't know if you can quite tell that. By default, usually when you import stuff into Unity, 
Um, it's got a few settings over here that you may or may not want to mess with. Um, the wrap mode, when you're working in 2D, almost certainly you want clamp as opposed to repeat. When you're working with 3D textures, you usually want repeat. Basically, the idea is, let's say you've got something like, I don't know, a stone pattern, right? and it's this big, but you want to overlay it on a huge area. And you don't just want to stretch it, you want it to repeat. So in a 3D texture, normally by default, it sets to repeat. With clamp, what actually happens is, theoretically, if you were to access a, a UV coordinate outside of the actual image, it's basically just taking the, the, the last pixel and it will just draw that one over and over. So depending on what you're doing, one way might look right, might way, one way might look wrong, there's no single correct answer. Typically when you're working with 2D sprites like we're doing now, you put it on clamp. Um, it avoids weird sort of blurring on the edges from it trying to repeat to the other side and doing some aliasing uh, and whatnot. The filter mode's the other one. Normally when you're working with like 99% of the textures you're gonna work with in 3D, you want some sort of filtering mode. This determines what happens. In your image, you have a bunch of individual pixels, right? So you have a square and you have another square over here. but if you are, especially if it's in 3D, if something's really far away or really close up, those pixels won't be represented one to one on your screen. If it's further away, really the two pixels in the image are gonna be slammed into the same pixel on your monitor, right? Or 10 pixels might be merged into seven on your monitor. And how do you deal with, with that? You've got an image that's 10 pixels wide, but because it's far away, it's only going to be about seven pixels wide on the screen. Or because it's close up, it's going to take up about 13 pixels wide on your screen. So how do you deal with those sort of in-between pixel issues? Um, if you have point filtering, or, or no filtering really is what this is, um, it doesn't. It just tries to pick a solid color. So if you had a red square and a blue square, and you got closer together, it would pick one versus the other. It would be, it would only show you the red square, or it would only show you the blue square. If you're further away, you might see something like red, red, blue or red, blue, blue. If you have some sort of filtering mode, then what it's gonna to try to do is just kind of blend those. So if you've got a red and a blue and it's further away, you're gonna get red, purple, blue. And if it's closer up, you might just have a purple pixel, the combination of the two. Most 3D stuff, you want some form of filtering. Often when you're doing 2D art, it depends. Depends if you've got more of a painted, high resolution 2D art. Um, and especially if things are gonna be moving backwards and forwards and have different depths and be sort of scaled in different ways, you'll probably want like bilinear or trilinear filtering. But if you want that sort of pixel perfect crispness, you're gonna want point filtering here, uh, which is what we're gonna want. If we do that, if we go back to our walls, you see how it's got a nice sharp edge now? Instead of that fuzzy edge, that's what the point filtering is. As another little technical thing and a little gotcha that you might have over here is sometimes with your drawings, with your compression, you might end up with some blurriness, um, some artifacting or colors not looking right. You may want to, in fact, turn off compression, especially it's a t this is a tiny little image. If we don't compress it, it's not the end of the world. Theoretically, th th your program might run a little faster if it doesn't have to uncompress an image every time it wants to access it. Um, it does use up a little bit more memory, both in your computer RAM and your graphic card RAM. Neither one of those is really a big argument. If you have tons and tons of graphics, you can't really do uncompressed for everything. Um, but for in this case, the uncompressed won't make a big deal one way or another. Um, on the other hand, if uh, if we were seeing some weird stuff with our colors, we may want to turn that off or use you know high quality versus whatever. Um, and there's other things to do with it. For our purposes, I'm just going to turn it off over here so that we don't have to worry about it. But you know, it's this is going to be varying by case by case every time. All right, so we've got that. We've got some sort of tile map. Now we want to start drawing our map. Um, and for that, there is in our windows over here, I think under 2D, there is the tile palette. So, tile palette. What we want to do to place the image. Now, if this were a regular image, right? If this were just a random image, I could take one of these and just throw it into my program. Let me move it away. So I'm not working with a tile map right now. This is just a 2D sprite. It's just a graphic like any other. I can move it around woo, and do stuff with very exciting. Um, that is just a 2D sprite. If I want it to fit within the tile map, we technically have to do something else because um, we want the tile palette here, which is what we're gonna use to draw into the tile map. It needs a palette to exist. So we can create a new palette. So let's call this, let's call this the wall palette. 
So this is going to be all the graphics we're going to use to draw our walls. Sure, fine. Um, with a program that is kind of this small, you can really, um, you can get away with, um, uh, words are hard. Uh, you can get away with having basically everything, all your ghosts or goalies, your players and everything like that in a single tile pad. Well, I'm not actually going to use a tile map for those. Uh, so, But we might use a tile map for our power pellets. So we might have the same tile map for our power pellets or we might use a different one. It really just comes down to organization um, more than anything else. Um, and in fact, that's the biggest thing in programming. Most of the time when you're saying, should I do something this way or this way? Usually both approaches will work. Possibly one will be slightly more optimized and run a little faster or something like that. Um, but in a lot of cases, it, it, there's not a notable speed difference. The big question is, What's the best way to keep things organized for you? Because your brain power is the ultimate limiter. Um, maybe we'll we'll use the graphics folder over here. That's going to be fine. Uh, and I'm going to make a new palette uh, in here. So it's going to be the wall palette. Oh, sorry. I just I already put in the name. All we're doing is choosing a folder to save it in. So I'm going to do that. So now I have a new palette. If we look in my graphics folder over here, I indeed have this new wall palette put in over here. Um, and we can tweak that now. It's got a palette, but it doesn't have any tiles in it yet. Now, you can make your tiles ahead of time. Tile, it's a little fuzzy because you're like, well, I have these sprites. Technically, you have to turn the sprites into a tile before you can use them in, as part of a tile palette. But if you just drag it in, it will go and make a new tile for you. In my graphics folder, I'm going to make another folder called tiles. And just save this in here. It's a little cumbersome, but now we have this tile object. You don't really do anything much with this tile object, although you can colorize it, which is cool, and you can mess with some different collider options over here, which I don't think will be within the scope of what we're doing today. Well, maybe. We'll see. Um, but now you've got that. Mostly it just happened automatically. You don't have to worry about it. We've got this. I could drag another wall uh, image in here, and again, it's got to make its own tile as well. So we're going to go ahead and save that. You can make your, your tiles ahead of time, or you can just drag it in here. Usually dragging in is just fine, and you're just going to go ahead and do this. Now that we've got our tile palette, if we click on our tile map, and we choose something in our tile palette over here, you see it's got the little brush icon? We can now draw this in. Hey, that looks not great at all. Why doesn't it look great? Well, Unity has its sort of world space coordinates, right? It has its own coordinates in the world, position one, position two, three, four, you know, position 1.5 by 2.7, you know, some sort of coordinates in the world. Um, and at some point it's got effectively, okay, let me backtrack a little bit here. Effectively all 2D applications are really 3D applications now. And the reason for it is this, your graphic card is really fast at drawing triangles and a square is just two triangles put together. So even if you're working on a 2D application, it's really gonna use 3D stuff. Um, that might have a different API. The graphic card might internally have a different API, but all it's doing is it's just drawing triangles to the screen, which seems silly, but it turns out if you make a piece of hardware that's just optimized to drawing triangles on the screen, you're gonna use that even if you're not doing th truly tr three-dimensional stuff. And we can see that it's three-dimensional here in Unity. If I turn off the 2D mode, you can clearly see what's going on here. We've got this, this tile map of ours is just this 2D plane that we're putting things on. Now, it doesn't know necessarily how big these graphics should be. This feels a little unintuitive when you're working in a grid, but let's say I just drop an object in. Again, this is not gonna be part of the grid. This is just an object that's sitting there. There's no reason I can't just sit here and scale everything, you know, and stretch it out that way. Hey, that's fine. And really, you're allowed to scale your grid and your tile map too. I don't know if you're gonna do that very often, but you can totally do this, right? If, if for some reason you wanna do that, maybe it's just for a special effect for some reason. But at some point, Unity needs to know, hey, uh, this graphic, you know, yeah, I know it's 20 pixels by 20 pixels, but how big do you want that to be in my world coordinates? And don't get involved with trying to scale things up here or doing weird stuff like that. That's not the solution. The solution is to go back to where we're importing our sprite. Because one of the options in here for our sprite is this hint of, hey, how many pixels wide, how many pixels do you want to fit in one world unit, right? A, a single world unit of one by one in Unity space, how many pixels do you want me to fit in there? And it defaults to 100, just 
It's got to default to something. Um, in our case, we know our tiles here are all 20 by 20. And wouldn't it be perfect if a 20 by 20 tile fit exactly in a, you know, one by one world space? So that's what we're going to do. We're going to apply this. Oh, <gasps> now everything looks right. Now, the, the upshot of this is theoretically, you could use sprites and tiles that are drawn to different resolutions. Your background, maybe you draw it super simple. You just do 20 by 20, but your foreground sprites, maybe you want to do really high quality sprites. So you end up doing 100 by 100 sprites, but you want your, your 100 by 100 sprite to fit on the one, you know, on the 20 by 20 background. Well, you can do that with just the sprite mode. That usually doesn't happen. Usually you sort of pick a, a kind of resolution to work with and you kind of just stick with that. What's the difference between that and changing the grid? Well, um, for changing the grid side here scales the entirety of the grid. Um, and then over here, you can also mess with the, the cell size, but you can see here what's changing. It's not changing the size of the graphics. It's changing the spacing between the cell elements, which is actually kind of cool. Like maybe for whatever reason, you want to use this tile system, but you want there to be a little bit of a gap between each square. Uh, you can do it that way. Uh, you can also actually do the gap, which ends up being the same result, but internal calculations work a little bit differently and depending on what math you're doing. But that's not what you're looking at. Like here, you're just messing with the grid, right? Um, you're not changing the sort of size of the actual checker pieces on there. Um, and what you also want to do as a general rule is eliminate how many fussy scale slash position changes you have to do. We're going to be talking about this in a bit when we talk about the anchor point of a sprite for a little moving unit and things like that. Um, there's multiple ways to get where you're trying to get in the end, but you want to pick the way that makes it the least fussy, partially because it's annoying to deal with, but partially because anything that's a little fussy or finicky tends to lead to mistakes. It's something that's very easy to miss. So now that we have our tile size correctly, um, did I, I guess I closed that. Let me, uh, reopen my tile palette over here. Let me just shove it onto the other side of the monitor here. Um, let's do a little drawing. Actually, hold on before I shove it over. Let me just shrink it down a little here. Um, let's erase a little, um, uh, let's do this. So what is it? What does a Pac-Man map look like? Um, there's hotkeys for this too. I can't remember what they are to quickly, uh, toggle, I guess D to, dis to delete and then B for brush, right? I thought you could hold shift and things like the so in in Pac-Man, the, the ghosts start off in some sort of like, well, this is the net that the goalies come from, because that's totally how it works. And then um, I don't know. Well, uh, this um, this will delete you and you and you uh, will brush something kind of like this. Actually, maybe what I'll do is I'll do some sort of corner and theoretically we're going to try to eyeball something kind of symmetrical, uh, do a little something like this. Um, maybe that, I don't know, something like this. I mean, there's no reason it has to be symmetrical, but I mean, maybe, uh, that let's do this. Let's do this. Um, I don't know. And, and we'll put the whole thing in a box. Whoops. There are other, um, other sort of drawing modes and things. I cannot draw a straight line. Anyone who's ever watched anything I've done, especially all the factorial this week will know for sure. It is impossible for me to do anything in sort of a straight line. Um, oh, this is actually a really kind of boring layout here. There's a straight lines over here, but that's okay. And then... Um, I don't know, something like this, like that. Yeah. Okay. Like that, like that, like that. There we go. We got ourselves a little bit of a map. Woo. Um, anyone getting the optical illusion blocks are changing shades of blue. Yeah, I know. Right. The blue on this gray looks very weird. Let's change the background real quick. Uh, we're just going to change the, uh, the camera render to be dark that, um, which, oh yeah, it doesn't change it over here. There's a way to change the background of your, uh, your scene. Uh, would it just be in the lighting? I think it is. Let's not stress about it. All right, we got something like this. Now, what you can then do is after you've got your initial layout, that's when you can go and you can grab your other thing and say, okay, well, let's make a pretty corner there, um, there. There must be other places I can use this one piece. 
Wow, maybe not. That's crazy. Okay. And anyway, you can have the rest of your sprites and do that. But I mean, the first pass, don't don't bother because you're probably going to be changing your map a bunch. Use one generic piece, do that, and then afterwards make it pretty. Now, there are ways for you to have a sort of a programmatic um, brush that will smartly use um, the you know tiles depending on what neighbors they've got. They've got one example sort of built in, and there's a good Unity tutorial that's got another download that you can do. It's not sort of built in properly all the way and things like that. We're we're gonna we're gonna ignore it for the purposes of this tutorial. But you can have it sort of be smart where you put it down, it'll automatically detect which neighbors and, and you know save yourself some a little bit of clicking time. But that's a little bit beyond the scope of what I want to mess with today. Oh yeah, the southeast end over here, but I guess that would be it. Three. One, two, three. Is that really all I ended up with for this piece? Well, I chose the wrong piece. Oh, anyway, We're going to call that good and done and perfect. Now, you'll notice every now and again, there's a little bit of an artifact that shows up with some of these things. Um, you see that? What's going on here? If you remember our, our graphic, if we look at it in the sprite editor, there's this green line in between each one of these. And because of the way it's trying to figure out which tile to draw where, and because at different zoom levels, effectively each one of these tiles is being stretched, right? Sometimes it's grabbing a little bit of that green that's in there. Now, ideally, to one step to helping to avoid this problem is to not having these these sort of lines dividing up your little sprites. But that's not, you know, that's not the only thing going on, because what you might still find is a gap. In this case, if we didn't have a green line, if there was just a little space there, you'd actually see a space show up. And this has to do with having sort of pixel perfect kind of art showing up here. Um, and there's a bunch of things we can look at for uh, pixel perfect drawing, and we'll fiddle with it a little bit later on. Um, but that's what it's coming down to. It's because at our various zoom levels and the size of our camera, there's different grabbings going on. I think I think that's all it is. I don't think, I think I say everything okay. Point filtering clamp is, is fine. Um, we got no compression. Yeah, it's probably mostly just that. Yeah, it's a little bleeding. There, there's the term I'm, I'm thinking about. It's not anti-aliasing exactly, but sort of, or it's aliasing versus the whole thing with um with the import, uh, the filter modes, for example, is sort of with aliasing. We're gonna ignore that green line for now, um, because we're probably gonna be fiddling with other graphical things as we go. And um, it's just, we'll wait until we sort of get into that little fiddly stuff going on. All right, let's work on our player now. And we'll, let's get work on getting this guy moving around. So uh, this looks like a Zamboni. Just to keep going with the theme. So I'm gonna grab this. Obviously there's a bunch of squares. We could set up some animations, but for now, let's just choose the one. Um, and let's call it player. Um, what we might want to do is, is label this later. Like, so if you got player idle, uh, and then you might want to number the individual frames. Um, so really this is, so if this is a player idle animation here, when they're facing south, so this is player south idle, and this is probably frame zero, one, two, three. So it's kind of player south idle one or down, because he's facing sort of down or forward at this point. Um, we might want to have our graphics sort of look like it's oriented in different ways. Yeah, it looks a little sad, I gotta say, but we're gonna we're gonna call it something like that. You can totally rename these later on, it's totally okay. We're gonna have our player. Now, our player here, we can just get our sprite, drop it in here, and there we go. We've got a player, he's sized appropriately because he's still told to uh, 20 by 20 pixels is the side of one world space. So the player will probably start here, and that looks great and lovely. But already I'm doing something that I tell every time I do a tutorial, I say, never do this. This player object, which at this point we can rename as anything, right? This is so this is player. This is our player or the Zamboni or whatever. This game object has its sprite render, has its graphics as part of its root game object itself. And every time I do one of these tutorials, I say never, ever, ever have your graphic information or usually your collider information as part of the root object itself. Because if you decide 
you want to change something later. What if all of a sudden, instead of a one graphic, we have a two part graphic, like maybe we want, you know, the mouse to move up and down as an independent graphic, or we want to throw in a rotation. Well, right now, if we want to spin this around, like right when you die, we could, we, you know, you know, we could do something like this, but then we're spinning the entire root object itself. And that leads, man, you're, you're just going to, you're going to hit a situation and it's not going to take long and it's not going to be rare. You're going to hit into some sort of situation where this becomes a massive pain in the butt, huge problem. Uh, and you'll hate yourself for it. Always start all your objects. This works whether we're talking about 2D or 3D. Start with an empty game object. So this empty game object is going to be our player. And inside of that, we're going to have our graphics. And the nice thing about this is if we decide, you know what, the graphic needs to be a little smaller or bigger, or what if we want a little animation that, um, why? There you go. What if we want a little animation that sort of pulses like this, right? I could definitely see situations where you might have a little animation like this. If you're scaling the base player object, things get weird and wonky. It's just, it's a problem. Instead, just scale or rotate or whatever the heck you want to do, the graphics themselves. It lets you just mess with them, make all sorts of changes. It makes it really easy for you to change your mind. What if instead of a 2D graphic, we want to use 3D art? There's no reason we can't use 3D art inside of a 2D object. And then all of a sudden you just like remove the old thing, you put in the um, graphics 3D with the mesh and everything like that in there and boom. All your game logic goes on this, all your sort of visual, that's not spelled right, but it doesn't matter. All your visual content goes inside of it over there. You just, oh my God, I can't, I mean, I know I'm overstressing it, but man, oh man, it'll save you so many problems. Now, obviously you want your graphics part of it to be centered inside your parent. Usually, I'm going to get to this in a second. Um, usually you want it centered, but sometimes you might want it offset. That's the other thing, because now we get to an interesting question. Let me, uh, let me zero up our object over here. Um, we don't want it to start here. Obviously we want it to start kind of here. And if we look, okay, it looks like, um, negative, uh, negative 0.5 and negative 1.5. There we go. That centers us up there. Clearly the graphic isn't quite centered. Oh, well, let's make a little adjustment. You know, if we just offset it this way. There we go. That looks way more centered. So the graphic is just slightly offset from its parent root. That's great. But then you also get this thing. Hey, these half coordinates. Kind of awkward, right? Wouldn't we agree that just conceptually, and it turned out it'll make our math and everything way more clean and simple. If our object just could sit at like this, let's call this, wouldn't it be nicer if this was something like zero and I don't know, minus one. Yeah, that would be that, that would look pretty good, wouldn't it? Like just we want clean numbers. Then we get in the situation, but okay, but the graphic isn't there. Why is it not there? Well, the reason has to do with the anchor point of our sprite. Let me let me re just zero this out. So we want this at zero minus one because conceptually, this is probably zero zero, I assume. If I make an empty, let's just go and check. Um zero. Zero, zero. Okay, zero, zero is actually over here. So my 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 grid isn't isn't um isn't centered, but that's fine. Well, this is the center point of my grid. So when I drew my table, whatever. We probably want to use whole numbers whenever, but our graphics aren't in the same situation. So again, if I center this up over here, there we go. So this is a player that's set at zero, zero, and it's sitting here. If this is tile zero, zero, this one over here, which almost certainly is when our players at zero, zero, shouldn't it look like this? I think we can all agree that that's probably correct. If this is tile zero, zero, when our player is at zero, zero, it should look like this. So how do we make it look like that? Well, I just gave you an example. We just offset the graphics Boop, like that. Done. Easy peasy. Um, the other thing you can do is you can mess with the sprite. You can change its anchor point. So in the sprite editor, if we look at our graphic of our dude over here, it has, it's got its pivot point or anchor point over here. This little thing there, you can see it's pivot, it's set to the center. Uh, we can change it. I could change where the pivot point of this is. If we set this to the bottom left and applied this, now if I go back to my player 
and I zero up my, my graphics again, now it's looking right. Because the anchor point or the pivot point of the graphic is at the bottom left corner of the graphic, which happens to be also basically where the, the correct anchor position for some of these things are, and it starts to look okay. I personally feel like you should avoid the micro fiddly um, pivot point playing in here because it's really easy to miss and or okay now that's great it's easy to do for one time but there's like i don't know 50 graphics in here i'm gonna go i have to hit the center pivot button for or, or the bottom left pivot for all of these whenever possible leave things to the default and find the single most simplest way to fix things so that's one example um is we could fix the pivot point the other thing we could do is we could fix this offset over here like this of the graphics. So the player thing is still at zero, zero, there's that. The next thing we could do is we could mess with the grid. The grid itself could just be moved over. The grid has its own tile anchor. One place to change the number. If we just tell the grid, not even, we're not even messing with its sprite. In the tile map itself, we're saying, listen, we want your anchor point to be zero, zero like that. And then all of a sudden, Everything else just slides in perfectly without having to do a little bit of micromanagement. That's probably the slickest option. But again, there's multiple different approaches, but whenever possible, trying to find the way that's less fiddly. I think I'm pretty happy with this. Our player's sitting at zero, zero. The graphic inside of it is sitting at zero, zero. The grid and the tile map itself, I haven't moved it because you can, but that tends to lead to big heartache, right? Like I could take the whole grid and move it, but eh, no. No, 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 I don't want to do that. This seems to me like the simplest one. Maybe we'll run into some other issue later on as a side effect of this, but almost any solution you pick here will have some side effect later on. The thing we have to remember with the players too is the, um, is the anchor points, where are they? Is it in the middle, is it in the bottom left? How are we gonna do math to offset things? These are all issues we're gonna to have to deal with later on, but for now, we're kind of okay. All right. <laughs> Um, I did. I went with an offset in the tile map over here, the tile anchor. It defaults to 0.5 for the tile anchor here. I set the tile anchor to zero, which seemed like the simplest, cleanest way to uh, to clean everything up. Now, um, for our grid here in the tile map, this is really the uh, the wall tile map because we might have different tile maps. We might have one for the background. Um, I also think that perhaps when we put down our little pellets or our pucks, um, we might use a tile map for that too, because our pucks will, we're gonna want to fit a grid, right? We're gonna want them to be grid aligned. So we could probably use a tile map for that too. But let's make our player move around. So we're gonna write our first script. Hey, we're almost an hour in. We're starting to write some code. We'll write our first quick, uh, uh, script over here. Now, this thing, yeah, it's the player. We could make a script called player or something like that. And, by the end of the game, we probably will. But let's think about this first. This thing is something that needs to move around the arena or the maze. Um, and it's not the only thing that's gonna be moving around here, right? The player, as well as the goalies, the ghosts, will move around the maze. And who knows, maybe there'll be other stuff later on. Uh, maybe it'll be multiplayer. So there's gonna be remote networked player that move around the maze or some damn thing. Or maybe there's gonna be a second um, Zamboni driver that's AI driven that's gonna try to eat more pellets than you are. These are all different things that might move around the maze. So it often makes sense to generate one component for all your things that basically move in the same way. I'm gonna call this maze mover. Done. I'm gonna create a script called Ma maze mover. And this is gonna be responsible for handling the logic of anything that moves around in the maze. Now, how are we gonna move things? Well, if we were doing something fancy and we're trying to use a lot of high-end stuff, maybe we could, use, we could use physics, right? We could use forces, we could use collisions to bounce off walls, all those sorts of things. Do we need any of those things? No, think about how it would have worked, um, <laughs> ECS, um, in, in you know, the original Pac-Man days. They, don't, they didn't have a physics system written for any of this stuff. No, we don't, we don't need anything like that. Um, what we really need is basically, um, so when it moves, it's gonna have, okay, uh, we have some kind of direction that 
we are direction slash velocity, right? Because velocity is is a vectored speed, right? It's speed with a direction that we are moving in. So move in that direction. If we can, what if there's a wall in the way? Then we stop. This is what the maze mover code is going to be responsible for. It's got no logic. It doesn't care about inputs. It doesn't care about um, uh, it doesn't care about AI. It doesn't do anything like that. Its singular goal is to move in some sort of direction unless we're going to hit a wall. Now, our position is going to be very simple, right? Our position at any given time is just going to be determined by, say, our transform dot position. All right, that, that's where we are. And so really all we're doing to move is we're going to be applying some sort of velocity to this. The velocity is our is our direction in a speed. Now, we could split these two. And I think actually, I think that would be fairly fair to do that. I think what we should have is we should have one value that is our speed. Um, this will become public, so I'm, I'm uppercasing it. So by convention, I normally do lowercase for um, sort of a private uh, variable like this um, and an uppercase for one that's public. I'm going to make it public. I try to avoid making it public until I've got a good default, because once you make it public, Unity will serialize it and it'll be in the inspector. And if you want to change that value, even if you change what this is equal to in the code, if you go from 10 to five, it's not going to change what's currently loaded in the inspector. And you can find yourself in a weird thing where you're like, you're changing this number and it's making no difference. And you're like, wait, why? It's because this only sets the original default, but the current value is in the inspector. So I like to just start with it being um, private like this and um, and then once I've got a reasonable default, then I'll make it public and we can mess with it in the inspector and do things in the in the more Unity way. Uh, thanks for the uh, gift subs, uh, Dorthak. That's really awesome. Mm -hmm. So the input is determining where the Zamboni looks and the actual movement is on auto. Yes. Basically, in, in a Pac-Man style game, um, all the player is doing by hitting a, a direction key on the joystick or an arrow key or whatever is is choosing the direction, right? Is It's choosing the facing and then the unit just keeps moving in that direction, whatever direction it's facing effectively. So um, this represents how many world space tiles this unit moves in one second. Or put another way, um, the inverse of this is how long it takes to move from one tile to another. So right now it would take one fifth of a second to move from one tile to another. Sounds a little fast. I don't know how quick Pac-Man moves. Well, it depends on what, you know, <clears throat> how far in you get, because I think he goes faster and faster and faster, right? Let's say, I don't know, we'll, we'll just choose three. I don't know if this is right. We'll just choose three arbitrarily. And then we'll mess with that. Um, and then uh, this means the, the, the splitting the speed from sort of the, the direction slash velocity. This is the thing that we're going to be tuning publicly. And then privately, what we're going to have is some sort of value that represents the direction we're moving in. Now, in the olden days, this probably would have been an int or an enum, right? Where like direction uh, is zero, where like zero is up, one equals right, etc. That would be, would be probably the way it was done way back when. You could do a little cleaner with some enums or things like that. I think we can probably just go ahead and use a vector to indicate that. It's maybe a little bit of overkill, but it avoids like it avoids like a big a switch case statement later on, right? Because if you use a number, right? If it's something like int dear equals zero, then later on over here, what we're having to do is probably some sort of like switch based on direction, case zero, moving up, blah, 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 blah. Int seems fiddly. We work perfectly fine. There's nothing wrong with this. But if it looks stupid, it probably means that it's not as... Um, Code that looks elegant is often better because elegance means it's easy to understand. The amount of CPU time, honestly, by us using a, um, a vector over here, might technically use a little bit more CPU time. Not really, because we we're going to end up like converting everything to floats anyway in the end, so I don't think it makes much of a difference. But it's going to be a lot easier to follow. So this is going to be probably something like 
um, direction. The current direction we want to move in. Is this even the way we want to do it? Consider this. What does it mean to move in a Pac-Man-like maze? Yeah, we've got a direction, but at the same time, we're also just moving to the next tile. At any given point, we are somewhere where we're going, but we're moving to the sort of the center point of the next tile. And when we get there, we're gonna then try to move to the next tile and the next tile, the next tile. It's possible we won't use this, but let's use this as our first pass and see what we think about it. So we're gonna have some sort of direction. Uh, and uh, this is, a, we're gonna be feeding in some inputs. What I'm gonna do as a test, make sure it works. So we're going to set a direction. We're going to new vector to, uh, we're going to go one, zero. So we're saying we want to start by moving to the right. Positive X towards the right. So we're just going to set this little extra value in here. Okay, now that we've got that, we don't got this. What's our code looking like? Well, um, the first thing is how far, you got to remember, this is a per frame thing. For, okay. Let's talk about the difference between update and fixed update, first of all. Because in Unity, there's both of these. And there is some slightly conflicting information as these two. The difference between update and fi fixed update is update is called once per, like, graphic frame. Okay? So every time the screen is refreshing, update gets called. This is the best place to read inputs and uh, do things like updating um, animations. Okay, because you want animations and things like that to upgrade on, on update on every single graphic frame. Whereas fixed update is called um, once per physics engine frame. This is the best place to do any movement if you care about any part of the physics system or want, and this is important, um, uh, what's the best way to word this? Sort of logical consistency, determinism, uh, deterministic, deterministic behavior, behavior, um, regardless of visual FPS. Um, inside of Unity, by default, the physics system ticks 50 times per second. If we go into our preferences here, and uh, nope, sorry, not preferences, edit project settings. Um, time? Yeah. The fixed time step over here, this is how frequently the physics engine ticks. So 0.02, it ticks 50 times per second. Now, it's not exactly that because it's still, you know, because of various things might tick slightly slower from time to time, um, but it'll do some catch-up behavior and various things like that. For our purposes, it's not too important that we use fixed update. Although, I think I will just for whatever. Now, Maybe not. Fixed update. Um, let me reword this slightly. This is the best place to update the physics system um, velocity if you are using it to move your player. That's probably the best way to say it. Um, if the physics system itself is moving your, your object, right? So you set a velocity and then it just moves because you set it on a rigid body that is physically animated and things like that. You set the velocity here, this execute right before the physics engine does its thing. Um, and it actually does it kind of threaded, which is why you, the fixed update is sort of the cleanest place to do it. Because um, if you do it an update, you might end up, depending on your frame rate, you might update might run twice before fixed update does, or fixed update might run twice before update was. So there's a little bit of a disconnect over there. Since we're not using the physics system to move, we don't need to worry about fixed update. I'm gonna leave this note in here.
uh, our objects are not physics enabled rigid bodies. So um, the physics system isn't moving us, nor are, are we doing real collisions. So we don't need to stress about fixed update. One of the things that also leads to confusion with fixed update is for some reason, some people think that time that delta time does not work correctly in fixed update. It totally does. Um, the time dot delta time will be correctly set when fixed update gets run. Time dot delta time will be con correctly set to the um, amount of time that has passed since the last time fixed update was called. So inside of update, it's the last time update was called. Inside of fixed update, it's the last time fixed update was called. So time dot delta time will always do the right thing, no matter where you are, which is lovely. Oh okay. yeah. So all that to say, hey, we're gonna work an update over here because we're just gonna move ourselves and we want it to move. You want your object to move every time the, the screen gets refreshed. Otherwise it'll look a little jerky. If the physics system, if you're just setting a velocity in the rigid body and the physics system is moving it, then it's gonna be fine because it, it does some amount of interpolation and things like that. Um, th these are settings that you can you can tweak with to make the, the, the motion look correctly smooth um, on the visual update. But yeah, we're gonna move over here. So uh, we're gonna have a direction <clears throat> we wanna move. So um, we need to know how far we should move this frame. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's gonna, it's gonna do the correct thing. You can you don't have to worry about using time dot fix delta time. You can just use time dot delta time because it gets set to the correct value. So it, uh, it it'll always do the right thing, and that stops you because sometimes you end up writing a code, right? You end up writing something. You have some 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 for function, um, a function called foo uh, gets called during update, and in here you're doing something with time dot delta time, and then later on. You change some of your game logic, so all of a sudden foo gets called during fixed update. Well, time dot delta time still does the right thing. Or inversely, if you were using, um, if this was something you originally worked wrote for fixed update, and you used fixed delta time, and then all of a sudden this is like something that works better here, this may no longer do what you were hoping to, it would do. So just use time dot delta time, and everything will go smoothly. All right. So we know in the end we want to move our object. A um, couple of different ways we can do it uh, are transform. So the transform is the part of your game object that um, determines its position, rotation, and scale in the Unity world space. Um, you don't have to do a get component on it because it is accessed all the time. So they just have it easily accessible this way, which is lovely. Um, you can move it in a couple of different ways. You can do... Yeah, that was an interesting autocomplete. How come I'm going crazy about something? How come it's not autocompleting? I must be missing um, missing something. I did do uh, an update on um, on Unity, and it might, or there's just something I'm goofing about. I might have an error in my compilation, or I'm having a complete and utter brain fart. Both are totally possibilities. Not a capital T because we're not. Um... Yeah, you compile okay. Capital T would be the class. We're just accessing our member. I think this is fine. Let me just, as a quick test. Um... Yeah, I don't. I don't have any of my autocompletes. Ah, oh, yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm missing something in my setup. That's rough because um, the autocompletes are a really good sanity check to make sure that I'm doing things correctly. I'm just missing something in my setup. Um, so you can change your position by doing something like uh, transform.position equals the current transform.position plus something. That's one way to change it. The other way, and as far as I know, it's exactly equivalent, is to use transform.translate um, and some sort of, you know, some sort of value like direction. We're not gonna use direction directly over here, but you can do this. As far as I know, and someone in the chat might know otherwise, I think those are equivalent. Transform.position equals transform.position plus direction it would be the same as transform.translate direction. Um, you can, oh, with no autocomplete, oh my God. 
Um, you can choose if it's local space or world space. Defaults to world space because 99% of the time, that's exactly what you want. So in the end, we're going to move by foo. So what is, what is foo going to be? Well, I mean, it might feel like, okay, it's the direction, right? We're going to, we want to move in this direction. Oh, well, we want to move based on the speed because if our direction, let's assume that our direction is a normalized vector, um, which means it has a length of one. So like this, well, we want to multiply it by the speed. Okay. So you could do something like this, but what this would do is this would move this much distance. So we'd be moving three world units to the right every single frame. Whether we're moving at 30 frames per second or 160 frames per second, it would move three world units to the right every single second. Obviously, this is bad. What you want to do is you want to multiply this based on how much time has gone by since the last update. And if we're doing a one liner, you do something like time dot delta time. This is the amount of time since the last update and using this. So you're going to be moving a fraction of a world space every update. But over the course of one second, you will have moved three units towards the right. Now, this is how we normally do it. I'm going to go and do it a little bit wordier over here. So the first question is um, float. Um, distance this update, which is going to be our speed times our time dot delta time. How far can we move this frame? It's this. And then, um, and in what direction is this movement? So our, we have a new vector three, or vector two, which is going to be um, the actual movement, this update, which is going to be our direction multiplied by the distance, this update. Like that. And then we feed it in there. L exactly the same code unless I screwed something up, which is entirely possible. Exactly the same code, but way wordier because we're doing a tutorial. Mm -hmm. Could the player object move diagonal in a 2D tile map game? Absolutely. There's no reason you couldn't do something like that, right? I mean, first of all, if I just set this to 1, 1, then every frame we should be moving up and to the right. And in fact, let's test this because this is obviously not what our Pac-Man guy is supposed to move like, but let's throw this in and then see what this looks like. And then let's find out if we've made any errors. So we're going to flick back over here to Puckman. If I hit play, if we've done everything right, our Puckman should move up and to the right. I'm as shocked as anyone else that that is working correctly now. Excellent. So we've got that. Now, obviously, in our Pac-Man game, we want our player to move orthogonally only. Um, which we don't have to do any special code for that. I mean, you could have a, um, you could implement some sort of test to make sure that you don't have anything wonky going on, but whatever, um, determines our direction over here, whether it's our AI or our player input, um, that is going to be responsible for only giving us, um, you know, uh, a cardinal direction, an orthogonal direction. I don't, I don't know what words mean, but one of those things, non-diagonal anyway, um, in there. So if we switch this back like that, and if I hit play, Chuka chuka chuka. There you go. We're just moving to the right. Perfect. Obviously, we don't want our guy to go through our walls. <laughs> Shock for sure, especially three lines of code. Extremely hard to determine what we'll do. Exactly. Um, how do we know if we're going to smack into a wall? Let's make a function. Good rule of thumb. First of all, make each one of your functions do as little as possible. In fact, while I very rarely actually do this myself, I would suggest in your update, your update shouldn't do anything. All it should do is call other functions. If you do that, you'll actually end up just, you'll happen to fall into some pretty good design kind of um, strategies, right? So our update over here, I'm gonna leave the fixed update note over there. We're gonna go down here. Let's make a new function here uh, called, I don't know, do move. We're gonna take all this code and post it over here. Now, if you're like me, you'll do this, run your program and be like, wait, why is nothing working? Pro tip, when you make a function, make sure to call it. So let's say we do this, excellent. 
But first we need to make sure is, can we move in the direction we want to move? What do we call it? Check valid direction? I mean, the pro it could be a boolean. Okay, so we need to make sure, first make sure we can legally move in the direction we want. So there's two ways to do this. One, we could do something like, um, uh, I don't know, update direction or something like this, where this is some sort of function. This uh, will change um, direction to a zero vector if we can't legally move that way, right? If our movement would bump us into a wall, we just change our direction, set it to zero, and then we don't move at all. This is absolutely a valid way to do it, and maybe your preferred way of doing it. You may want to avoid anything that changes some of your variables unless they're super explicit. Now here it's really explicit. We're literally updating direction. We're updating direction. Okay, that's pretty clear. But sometimes you'll write code and in your functions, you'll be making changes to these, some, some of these things. And it, it can make it hard to debug because you're like, wait, hold on. Oh, oh, it changes there. Oh, and then uh, blah, 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 blah. So that's one way of doing it. The other way could be something like um, direction equals um, update direction. The end result is very similar. This function here in the second version won't actually modify direction itself. It'll just return the corrected direction, which we might call actually something like get. Anything that returns something, calling it something like get can be pretty useful because it gives you a hint as to what's going on. Oh, this is supposed to return something. Get um, updated direction. Both totally super valid ways of doing things, 100%. Um, the advantage of the second one is that it makes it really clear that this variable is being updated, um, but means that update is sort of doing more work. I, I don't know. Tell you what, let's do something like this. Um, instead of, uh, yeah, update direction is probably okay. Um, check direction. The, oh, uh, one last thing to do is do something like if direction, if is direction legal. Um, a lot of people, anything that uh, functions that return a Boolean, true or false, uh, calling it is blah is good. So if direction is legal, then do move. Which way do people prefer? Makes no difference. Vote in chat. What do you think looks cleanest? I think I kind of like this. Does put a little bit more logic and update. I always feel really nice when my update, I think, yeah, people are voting for if, and I think I, I like that better. I always feel quite nice if my update function is literally just a bunch of, you know, do foo, do bar, do baz. It's nice and clean, but I think this is probably pretty slick here. If we'll crash, don't, I like it. So now clearly we need some sort of function, which is gonna return a Boolean called is direction legal. So we're going to assume if we get to the end, well, let me back up before I do this. So what does it mean to be illegal, to be a legal direction? Um, all directions are legal unless you'd be slamming into a wall. I have buzz in my mouth or something. Uh, probably... Probably mustache hair. How do we check if we're hitting a wall? Most programming is asking questions and trying to think of the best way to do it. So there are fancy ways to do it. And depending on the scope of our program, these might super be um, correct. For example, from our character moving to the right, what we can do is a little ray trace, ray cast, okay? You could use the, the 2D physics system to shoot a ray from your character to the right and detect if there's a wall over there. You could also, from your character, offset by one world space unit, and you can shoot a ray into the screen and see if you hit anything. Then you would know if there's something over there. Both of those 
to me, feel like overkill for this application, especially, and with something like Pac-Man, I like to think back of, well, how would they have done it way back, way, way back in the day? They weren't gonna use physics systems and raycast. I mean, the, the, the Atari and whatever did not have that much hardware to throw at it. The simplest solution is we can, we can just look up what tile would be here and see if there's a wall that way, rather than incorporating the physics system and doing anything like this. All we wanna do is say, listen, I'm, I'm sitting in this tile, and I'm moving to the right. So the tile to the right of me, is there a wall there or not? Yeah, 2D by the way, the thing is, if we were storing, right, if all these levels were part of a, of a bit map, i.e. like sort of an array of zeros and ones, we would just look up the appropriate spot in the array and check to see if it's a zero or one. And that's exactly what we're gonna do here. Now, the tile mapping system here um, that we're interacting with, doesn't get stored that way. Um, although if we were generating this tile map from a array of zeros and ones, we could just look that one up. But we can do something pretty similar here. Basically, we need to have a reference to the tile map. Oh, yeah, I'm, without the autocomplete, I'm gonna hurt here, but uh, we'll do what we can. So we're gonna have a reference to a tile map, and this is gonna be the wall tile map. We're gonna somehow have a reference to it. Right now, we don't, it's not anything. Maybe we make it public, we fill it into the, the, um, the inspector, we'll see. But in some way, we're gonna have this wall tile map. And what we need to do is we need to ask this tile map, is there a tile in this spot that I wanna enter? Is there a tile, is there a wall? Because it's specifically the wall tile map. The um, the the three hardest things in programming are naming variables and off by one errors. Just let that sit with you guys for a second. Dun, 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 dun. Well, here's what I propose. I think first of all. What we're really asking, so, okay, we're gonna have some sort of function. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't know, is tile present at some sort of position? And this is gonna have another little helper function, which is gonna be something like get tile at. Get the tile from the tile map at position pause. So this is gonna return something. And then over here, all we're saying is something like, we're gonna return get tile at position. And if it's equal to null, so um, this is going to return, either it's going to return tile in the coordinates we're asking for, or it's going to return null, and there's nothing there. So if this is not equal to null, that means there's a tile there. If it's equal to null, there's no tile there, and this will just return true or false appropriately, and then we can use that over here. Great stuff. So how do we get this tile? Hang on, I've covered up chat. Where is you? There you is. Best thing in programming is when you misspell a variable name and spell it correctly when using it. Yeah, that's really funny. Um, how much time in your hand? Variable names IJ care perfectly fine. Oof. I mean, I do use IJ and and K if you get to that point. Oof. For um for for loops. Normally, if I'm getting to the point where I'm having to use a K, I'm probably going to redo things otherwise, or use more verbose names, or uh, call a sub function or something like that, which is probably better. But I mean, using I for a for loop is pretty typical. And if there's a nested sub for loop, I and J, that's pretty okay because that, that's almost like calling a variable I is the same thing as calling it for loop index. That's just what I means in programming terms. Um, so that's pretty good. But yeah, if you I <laughs> JK, three nested loops, like no. I, what I would do is in a loop that calls a function and then that function, there's another loop that calls another function, a final function is one last loop. Like I definitely clean it that way. Okay, so how do we get the tile at a particular coordinate? So for this, you'd have to go into the help. It's like, all right, we know we've got a copy of a tile map and this is filled with a bunch of squares that are either there, in which case they're a wall, or they're not there, in which case it's empty space. So you'd open up the, um, you'd open up the Unity help and find out, and I did go and look this up earlier, um, is, this has a function called get tile. 
and you have to give it a coordinate. Now, I wish the autocomplete was here because it would tell us we're giving it a uh, we're giving it a vector, which is going to be the position in the tile map. That is not the same as the world position. Let's back up and see why that would be the case. If I flick back into Unity over here. So this spot right over here, this is the zero zero. I mean, first of all, this is the zero zero coordinate in world space. And it's also where tile zero zero in our tile map is. But if I take my grid and for some reason I move it over, over here, this spot here, this is still the tile in the tile map at place zero zero in the grid, but it's way the heck over somewhere else in world space. There's no, um, it's, uh, if you happen to have everything, you know, all your root of everything set to zero zero, then it'll happen to be that world position zero zero will line up with your tile position zero zero, but it's a coincidence and nothing more. It's simply a coincidence that no num those numbers happen to line up because in many other situations, they won't line up in any way whatsoever. So what we have to do is we have to ask the tile map, listen, I've got some, some, some random world position. Some some place in Unity, right here. This random place, like offset, right over here in this, right right there. And I want to know, hey, what tile in your tile map happens to fit that spot? There's a helper function for us for that. Oops, that's the wrong window. So if I bring it over here, there's a helper function as part of the the tile map called world to cell. So this will take a world position. Actually, let me break it into separate lines. First, we need to change the world position to a tile cell index. So we're gonna have this function. Um, I don't remember what this returns. Unity world to cell returns a what? Ah, it returns a vector three int. <laughs> which could be a vector two int. I don't think that tile maps operate three dimensionally, but a, uh, a vector, whether we're talking about a vector two or a vector three. Yeah, as I say, use var. Um, UK dude, I explicitly, and I was, I was gonna mention that uh, here because it would be a great case, right? Um, cell pause this. What var does is var um, will automatically use the correct, um, the correct variable type in here. I don't personally like to do this because I might want to remember, like later on, I'm you know some some deep into some code somewhere else, right? Uh, boom, 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 boom. I have to interact the cell position, and I mean like, uh, wait, what? What is it again? I mean, your IDE will auto, well, theoretically would auto complete or would give you contextual help if you moused over, um, and things. But um, I like to have it explicit where I can look in the code and be like, wait, what is it again? Okay, right, and it's a vector three end. So vector twos and vector threes use floating point numbers to, you know, because you can be at position 1.15 or something like that. This is an integer based one. So you can only get zero, one, two, etc. And our tile map, that's what it uses. So that's what it uses there. You could use a var so you don't have to worry about the lookup. But I like this because then I can see at a glance. OK, I know exactly what's going on. You hate var in that. Don't use var. It's a nasty habit. Yeah, I, I agree with Takurama. I think it's a bad habit because I think it makes your code less clear to look at um, because it's way less explicit. The, in terms of in runtime and what the compiler does, they're exactly identical. But the big difference is one helps the programmer and one hides stuff from the programmer. Always be as explicit as hell. You don't have to do what I'm doing here where I'm breaking it up into multiple lines. I'm doing this for the tutorial purposes. But if you use good naming for your variables and don't use var so you know what the hell your variables are, that is going to help a lot. Now return the actual tile. Um, this should not be returning tile map. This should probably be returning tile, I think. I think it's just called that. Or is it called tile map tile? Um, tile base. I think I know why they call it tile base as opposed to just tile, probably because tile is too small and gets used for too many things and, and might collide with a lot of people's names. Um, it's, so it's, this is sort of the base 
class for a tile and you can absolutely um subclass it and do all kinds of really cool things by subclassing from tile base uh it's a little little cumbersome uh but still the same thing so this is only all it's doing we don't even care what it's returning we're not using this value in this particular situation all we care is if it exists or not the thing is um it's surprising how little information you can get out of tile base itself um, if you really want some information about the actual tile, probably what's better is to, is to do a subclass. And then later on, when you get here is check to see, well, this tile base object that we got, is it actually a blah or is it actually a blah? If you need some sort of logic over there, but we don't care about any of that in this case, we just need to know if it exists. So in this case, it's going to return that. Uh, so it's going to return the tile at the position. It's going to tell us if there's something there or not. So then we're going to be over here. So that's great. So now we can do something like. Are we going to be hitting a wall? So how do we find out what the next tile will be? Let's start with a very naive approach, and we're probably going to discover that it's not going to work properly for us. Probably, maybe, it might. Let's take the most naive approach and see what it does. So we've got our current position. So um, let's see here, vector through to um, check tile position. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take our own position, transform dot position. We're gonna add the direction we're traveling in. So we're at a current position and we're going to the right. So we're adding X plus one. So we're taking our current position, adding one to our X. So one world space over to the right. And we're gonna check to see if there's a tile there. And if there is, we're going to we're going to return that. Nope, we can't move anymore. This is not going to work the way we want. But for now, let's do this. So all we're doing is we're going to return. And say uh, we're going to check is tile present at check tile position. And we need to invert it because if there's a tile there, then it's not legal. So we want to do the inverse of this. Now, the shortcut is to do that. I don't personally like doing this, especially my tutorial work, because it's very easy to not spot this exclamation mark. Whereas here, I want to say, we're going to return true, this direction is legal, if this returns false. If tile present is equal to false, then we're going to say it's legal, we're good to go. So we've got, we've got a little bit of inversion. What we could do really is direction legal is sort of, we could just do this and then, you know, but do a check to make sure it's null instead. I think it's going to be fine. Okay. Or I could have renamed this to is tile empty. And then we could have done equals null and then we would have returned things vanilla, right? Same logic. I mean, um, the compiler is pretty smart. What I could do is have this that calls return, you know, is tile present equals false. So it's inverting that. And then we just call is tile empty and the compiler will actually, um, they're, they, they've gotten really good at this point. We'll go and sort of unravel all this stuff and lead to something that's basically as optimal as if we had just done it, um, directly. The compiler is not smart. Don't call them names. Um, but this should theoretically be okay. Okay. So now we've got this, Hey, is there tile by the way, this, This ain't going to work the way the, the, the way we want, but we're going to take the naive approach first and see what happens. So now is direction legal? We do move. OK, let's give this a try. First, we'll see if we've got any compilation errors. I think it's still recompiling. No. Oh, tile base and tile map. Oh, I think I have to include something. Yes, I do. Um, the so as unity has grown they have finally moved everything out of a singular namespace because by default you do unity engine and that would have everything but now that it's grown they do have a few things into separate namespaces so for tile maps we have to go and say using tile maps for those functions over there um again if i had the uh, the, the the code completion link in here um it would have told us that and we'd be able to do something like um you'd be able to like right click on one of these and uh, auto-complete it. But if I was in Visual Studio, yeah, but even Visual Studio code would be there. I'm just missing something. Um, okay, we've got another error. Uh, operator plus is ambiguous on operand type op vector three and vector two. Ah, yes, okay. So transform.position is a vector three. It's got an X, Y, and a Z. Um, direction 
is a vector two because really all we care about is x y direction we could use vector threes for everything honestly the overhead difference is microscopically small but you can go and um, you can very easily use a vector two as a vector three and vice versa when you need it it doesn't ju it just doesn't do the automatic casting so what we'll do is we'll force listen our 2d vector yeah just pretend it's a 3d vector which is fine and then work that out it's going to be okay i like that it doesn't do it implicitly I, I like it when you know compilers force you to do things explicitly so um let me move my dude so he's got a little bit of space let me um let me move him uh over here actually this is going to be a good place to do it uh oh somehow ended up snapping it to exactly zero if we hit play over here you should start to move to the right and then at some point stop oh no! Aha! I'd forgotten a thing. We've got a, a wine here. It's saying that uh, we have an object that's not set to anything. Object reference not set to an instance of an object. Our wall tile map here isn't anything right now. It's just an empty null variable. It's declared, but doesn't have anything in it. It's not pointing to anything. Um, if, uh, if we were Zen Buddhist, it would be pointing to Mu um, right here. So we need to set it with something. Now, I am not a huge fan of the fiddliness of doing something like setting this to public and then in our inspector dragging a reference to it. The reason, uh, for some things I am, UI stuff, generally speaking, yeah, because um, the user interface stuff is very physical um having these sort of physical links that you're explicitly doing makes sense and one of the things with the ui is a lot of times like if you end up deleting something you, the link shouldn't exist anyway so it makes sense that it breaks the link uh for user interface stuff a lot of times you're not instantiating things on the fly you might be showing and hiding things but it tends to be sort of fixed but here what happens when our player dies and respawns well it's not necessarily going to have that link so we have to find a way to link it every time um and that so in this case i don't like this so instead of making it public, what I would like to do is have some way in the code for it to set itself properly. Now, I'm going to take a very naive approach first, which will work fine for now. This works as long as there is only one tile map in the scene. Later on, I think we're going to add a second one, but we'll, we'll, we'll burn that bridge when we get to it. What we can do when our maze mover starts up, it's going to look up and just find itself a, a wall tile map. At some point, if we do a second tile map, we're going to have to change this to be a little bit smarter. We'll have to find another way to do it. That's going to be fine. But for now, what we can do is do something like game object. Uh, find object of type. Man, I really wish we had autocomplete. Um, and what we're going to do is find tile map. This function is going to find the first object in the scene with a tile map component. It's actually got a pretty good amount of, um, of indexing and, and dictionary stuff internally that this doesn't turn out to be apocalyptically slow. You really want to avoid doing this sort of thing uh, every single update, um, but doing it on start like that is perfectly fine. So this will look through the entire scene to find the first object with a tile map component on it. Um, and it will store it in here. This will probably not work the way we want, once we have more than one, but it is great for this and it is bulletproof. Um, it, it is a little heavy. Again, you don't want to use it on an update that runs every frame. But what's nice about this is that you can't forget to drag and drop something. If something, if an object is destroyed and reinstantiated or come back like that, you don't have to necessarily, it doesn't have the same sort of broken link. Well, I mean, here it would because start wouldn't run again. One of the things you can do if you're worried about stuff getting created and destroyed, what you can do with something like this um, on your update is if this is equal to null, then go ahead and do this. So this won't actually do the fine object every single frame. It'll just do it on the theoretically occasional situation where something got destroyed for some reason. But we will, once we add our second tile map, have to find something more intelligent um, to work with this. But let's just do this for now. Get it working. Okay, so now the code should at least run. Still don't think it's going to run correctly, but it should run. That looked freakishly right. Let's see if it's freakishly left as well. This is where I think we'll get our first break.
where it's not going to work quite right. <gasps> Ooh. Oh, what is happening? Huh? It moves, but it stops a little too short. Why is that? Well, because our player, its position is just inside this extra tile over here. Just barely inside. So when we're checking the illegality and we're doing a minus one over to here, we see there's a wall, so we stop. It's an off by one, but only off by one in one direction. And the same thing will happen if we're going um, up and down. If I set you here, pull you up over here, and change your direction to be... Um, I think positive one will work correctly, but negative one will stop us just short again. There you go. Positive one, it goes up. It looks right. Negative one stops us just shy. There you go. One, one tile too early. So, as with most things in programming, there's probably a million different ways to address this. Um... One of the things I actually quite like to do that happens a lot is instead of tracking direction, what I often like to do is set a target tile. Because here's a funny little thing that can happen. Let's say we get to a T intersection. Let's picture this. So this is not related to the current problem, but I want you to sort of visualize another problem we have later on. We've got this guy and he's moving up. And then the player says he wants to move left. So you go and you click left and you're, you're hitting left and you're going left, but you're like, are you, are you properly centered up? Like really logically in Pac-Man, he always walks along the grid, right? And then right when he's in properly centered up in this tile is the only time he starts moving over there. How do we enforce that sort of cleanness and not end up in a situation where, oh, he's moving up, he's moving up. The player very late sort of did this. Because this, this is totally legal with everything we've written. It can do that. But it looks dumb. Right? It looks really dumb. So how do we solve that? Well, one of the things I like to do for grid-based movement is instead of just having a direction. Okay, my, my tab order is all messed up. Instead of having just a direction, I often like to set a target location move to. And what you can do is you can nicely just center up that target location. So... Um, and that, so I'm talking about this because if we go and implement it that way, instead of using a direction that we put in, in instead we put in our target that we're looking for right now. Well, we might still have the direction because this is going to be used to set the next tile we're going to be trying to move into. Then we can unify the legal move and whatever because we always know that we have, so we're going to have some sort of vector two target position. And this position is always going to be a legal always a legal empty tile and all we're doing is moving towards it and when we fit ourselves properly when we properly achieve our target position then what we do is we look at the direction we set a new target position and make sure it's legal and if it's not legal then we just keep the target position where we currently are and we stand still and do nothing i really like this way of doing things when we're working um in a in a tile map like this um, it ensures that your movement is always properly centered up on the tile and eliminate some of this because it wouldn't be too hard. We could just be something like, oh, okay, so when we're checking the position over here, we're doing something like, uh, if direction dot X is less than zero, because we know if we're going on direction minus one, this doesn't work correctly, then what we have to do is our tile position dot x, we need to actually add an extra one to fix this off by one stuff. And there's lots of times you're going to be having to do stuff like that. But it's a little awkward. And we're still left with the problem of we're not necessarily going to be centered up on tiles all the time. So here's what I propose, is that we do something like this with a target position. And what's nice about this is now all of a sudden we can do something like um, update target position. Instead of using this if that we had, and we had a little discussion about it, what if we had a thing that was update target position? And even with move, we can even just rename it to uh, move to target 
position. I like it. <laughs> do, do, do. Now, um, some of the issues that we're seeing here with the, the weird off by one, if your um, if your anchor point was like centered instead of the bottom left corner of a tile, then there's different math that would come in and different things like that. But the nice thing about this solution is it doesn't really matter. It doesn't care where your anchor point is exactly. So update target position. Um, okay, so we need this function to exist. Have we reached our target? So here's the thing. If we haven't reached our target, we don't have to make any changes. So what we want to do is we want to compare the distance from where we are to our target position. Uh, the best way to do the distance, I mean, it's minuses, but it's got a uh, both vector two and vector three have a built-in uh, distance function where you just feed it two vectors. Um, maybe I should just use vector three for everything. I mean, logically we don't, but it would save us some casting. It doesn't make a difference. Okay. Um, transform dot position versus target position. This is the distance to the target. How do we know if we've reached our target? Well, if the distance to our target is zero, then we're basically there. What we might want to do is allow a little bit of a margin, a little bit of a wiggle room to, to sort of snap in there. If we're within, you know, 0 0.01 or something like that, that might be good enough or something. Um, the other thing we can do is as long as is, is we might not worry about it. We might just like only check for zero. And instead in our move, if we're within sort of a little fudge distance, we'll just set ourselves properly on the target. So distance to target. If distance to target is greater than zero. Not there yet. No need to update anything. So we'll just return because we're still on our way to our target. Um, if we get here, it means we need a new target position. So our target position is our old target position plus the direction we want to move in. That's our new target position. Now, the nice thing is actually our target position here could really be a vector two int because we always want it on a perfectly whole number because it's going to match up with our grid. I don't think it makes a difference whether or not we specify that it's an integer or not, but Technically speaking, it should always line up there, so we could do that. I'll leave it off. So if we get here, it means we need a new target position. So our old target position plus our direction, that's where we want to go. And then what we want to do is check to see less about if the direction is legal, but more is the target, is the, 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 the position I want to go to um, legal or not. Let's make a few changes. I'm going to get rid of is legal direction. This will happen a lot. You'll end up refactoring your code. I'll also rename this to is tile empty. Because that's actually what we want to ask all the time. We're never asking is the tile, does the tile have something in? We want to know if it's empty. Probably. If is tile empty in our target position. If our target position is empty, good to go. We can just return. If we get here, it means that our target position is occupied. So we aren't allowed to move. So I'm going to set my target position to be equal to transform dot position. This autocomplete or lack thereof. <clears throat> Stand still. So we'll just do that. So I think if we do something like that, yeah, we can do increments, absolutely. Um, again, when I'm writing my uh, my tutorial code, well, I'll, honestly, it might actually be slightly clearer for tutorial purposes to do this. I mean, they're exactly equivalent in terms of writing. Um, but yeah, that might be a little bit actually clearer and more Englishy to say something like this. There you go. So we stand still. 
So now we update that and that's it. So in our movement code, um, the speed, the, everything like this, in, what we're gonna do is make a bit of a change. We're not gonna use direction anymore in our movement code. In what direction is this movement? Towards our target position. So what we're asking for now is a slightly different um, direction, which is the difference from transform.position, our current position, minus the target position. That's the actual direction we want to go into. Dear to target. There we go. Let's do that. And do this. And in fact, our direction here, I'm going to rename direction to desired direction. Desired direction, this is not the direction we're literally moving in, because if we're hitting into uh, hitting a wall, we're not really moving in that direction. But that's the direction we want to move into. So we want to move towards in de uh, desired direction, um, and target position is going to be based on desired direction, unless we're going to smack into a wall, in which case the target is just going to be zero. So the direction to the target, the distance this update is going to be there. Um, but here's the got you. What if we would be moving past the target let's say we're direction we're distance one to our target but we're going to be moving to this this update obviously they're actually going to be little fractional kinds of things right um subtraction to be reversed if the target is at one and we're at zero we want to move towards one you're right they do have to be inverted I don't know what key I just hit, but okay, that's fine. Um, yeah, thank you very much. And luckily, this is a pretty easy one to spot. As soon as we start going, we're like, oh no, we're going backwards. Um, so what if we're moving past the target? What if we're moving too fast? We only had a little way to go and we move too much. Now, that is, it's not, this, okay, this will always happen unless we happen to move exactly what we need to land on right on top, which is basically never gonna happen. But with a fairly high frame rate and the fact that our effective movement is small, we're, we're only ever gonna move we're past by like a tiny little scooch, which is fine. So what we do in this case, if we'd move past the target, really all we wanna do is we wanna land exactly on our target, right? We don't wanna overshoot or undershoot or anything like that. What we could do, we could um, change movement this update to have the same magnitude pop pop as uh, dis uh, distance to target, right? We can say, okay, well, if, if we're moving a two, but we're only supposed to move a one, what we can do is you can do something like movement this update. Um, that I don't think it's a set. I think it's you should actually do like magnitude equals, you know, some distance, but then, why, why would we do that? Instead, what we'll do is, um, so dearer to target, technically this is distance to target or vector to target, but we can just put in a little check. If the magnitude of this, and I'm not gonna use magnitude directly, but we're gonna change it. If the distance to the target is less than the movement we're gonna do this update, then what we're gonna do is just set our position to the target, not a move. So we're gonna say transform dot position is equal to our target position. And then we'll return. Just bail out. You use else's, but you tend to lead to much better non-nested code. A good example, of course, would be over here, right? Where we're returning, we're returning. Otherwise you'd be doing an if this, else, and then you nest and nest and nest. Just return early when you're done and do this sort of logic. So do this. Now, there's a little bit of a gotcha here. Calculating the magnitude of things. Now I think the vector magnitude tends to be cached, um, but um, in theory, if it's doing the math, it has to do a square root to find out the magnitude. Exactly, Dev. Um, that's what, I, yeah, exactly. To figure out the magnitude, right, the length of the vector, you have to do a square root calculation. Square roots are slow. It's not gonna be a problem in this program, 
But if we, we don't actually care about the actual length of the vector. We're just trying to compare the length of two vectors. So if we use the square of the magnitude, before it does a square root. So these numbers don't reflect the actual length of the vector. We would have to do the, the, the root of these to get the actual length. But we can certainly sure as hell compare these two. And this saves a, a, an expensive math calculation. You don't have to break your brain worrying about this, but a little pro move. Now, it's whiskey and chocolate. It's whiskey and chocolate. Oh, Brasta, thank you. Uh, missed you, Quill. Here's a reminder. I still love you. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Pablo Rasta. Much appreciated. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're going to set the position over here. I'm a little, I, I suspect that I've probably uh, screwed something up somewhere because this is a lot of changes in one go. But let's find out what happens. Well, first of all, we have an ambiguous uh, thing here because, yeah, we're going to force you to be a vector three or four. You know what? We'll start to force the other one to be a vector two. Let's... And, oh, these are function calls? Really? This is what I get for not having autocomplete. There we go. Hit play. Oh, that's not quite right. There's a lot that's not right here. So first of all, um, what is our direction? Let's, uh, whoa. Oh, um, that's because target position doesn't get set. Okay, what we want to do is set target position to be equal to transform.position. That's what we're missing. Set our initial target position to be our starting position so that um, the update will... Well, update. Well, update the target. Because it was just defaulting to zero, 0, so it was moving towards zero, 0, and ignoring everything else. Okay, let's try this one more time. I have this. Oh, and what direction do we have in here? Okay, we're moving to the right. Oh, okay. Well, a few things. Yes, okay. This is a mistake. So do you see how it's like slow? Exactly. Um, the, the normalization. Exactly. You see how it's slowly moving here? That's a pretty good sense that that easing to this position should be a little bit of a hint as to what's going on. If we're moving slower every time, that means the vector, our movement vector, is getting smaller every time. And why would that be? Well, um, distance this update should basically be the same because it's the speed times the time dot delta time. So that must mean deer to target must be getting shorter every time. And it is. Because deer to target is a little bit misworded here. This is really, this is the distance to the target. This is the distance to the target. So when, when it's brand new, it's a distance of one, right? It's a vector that'll be, have a value of one. It'll be one comma zero. And then we move a little bit, it'll be 0 0.9. 0 0.8, da, 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 da. So it's getting smaller, and we're never actually getting to the target, which is also why it's not moving to the next one. The distance of the target should probably be normalized. I think is the... I wonder if there's another way to do it. Now, there's two ways to get a, a vector to be normalized. There's actually a function. If we did this, dot normalize. So normalizing a vector means it's giving it a length of one. So that's one way to do it, which changes it. The other way to do it is to normalize, again, without the autocomplete, I'm worried that I'm spelling it wrong, but I think that's correct. So either way, we end up with a vector of length one that we can then multiply with the correct distance that it should be moving. Yeah, it, Zeno's Paradox, right? Yeah, Zeno's Paradox, exactly. And now if we hit play, first of all, we should be moving at a constant rate. And secondly, we should actually arrive at our tile and then continue moving. Yay! And it hit a wall. Now, let's try the invert direction.
Good. Um, I mean, our graphic alignment is is maybe not where we want it, maybe not the right size because it looks a little too high and different things too, right? Because this is currently, oh, it's not actually centered up, but it should be moving towards the center, is it not? Hey, wait, why wasn't it? Hold on, this whole thing. Oh, yeah, no, hurry. Oh, okay, I am missing something. Target position over here. Because the whole thing was to end up with the player always being correctly lined up in the in its lane, right? Which is not what's happening now. Our Our movement logic is kind of working. Kind of. But the player is not actually arriving in its lane correctly. Um, and the reason is here, our target position, we're just adding the dire desired direction, but this is not quite right. What we want to do is, um, I don't know, normalize the target position to the, um, uh, to like a tiles position, right? So we end up like on a proper cell lined up nicely. I don't know if this is the good and correct and proper way to do it in the end, but if assuming we don't do anything weird with like a grid, the, like moving the grid into a weird place, probably we can just we could just turn everything into integers. Really, we could sort of round like floor it to an integer value, the x and the y. Maybe target position should just be an int. The other thing we can do is we can run it, we can like map it to a tile and then get the tile's actual position, which is maybe the best way of doing it. You know what I mean? Like you, we look to the left, what tile would that be? Okay, what is the proper position of that tile? And then come back and set that as our, um, as our target position. That might be the most correct way of doing it. In the end, I think you end up at the same value. For now, let's um. Here's what I'm gonna do. Uh, no, I'm not gonna do it as one liner. Target position is gonna be equal to vector to int target position. This uh might not uh line up right if we have a weirdly offset tile map we might need a, a a more robust solution but um well then we can't set it right really like can i can i double no that's stupid right i mean oh it still doesn't let you convert really no that's not right is it huh I mean, I guess where you do um, floor math f dot floor to int. I don't really feel comfortable doing this. We're just trying to like chop off weird decimal things. Now it's really only a problem if we start in a wonky location. There we go. See that? Now all of a sudden it's lined up okay. And actually, let me um. Let me make desired direction into a public. Oh, pubic. Public. Because now I can control this guy through the inspector. It like floats to be correctly aligned. You won't see that because you should start with your dude correctly aligned in the first place. Um, zero, one. Minus one. Five won't change the speed, which is good. Um, minus one, zero, oh, no, positive one. All right, so he's correctly moving around here. Mm -hmm. I think, like, um, where's my note here? Uh, yeah, first of all, that's way too long. <clears throat> a better solution 
might be to look up the tile at target at the new target pause, then read back that tiles world coordinate. I don't know. I, I mean, a, a better, a, like, maybe it's more like more robust. But this should only be an issue if your actual tile map object is moved in a weird way. But I want to put in a note because if, for, if you're doing something really weird with your tile map, you might run into this not working the way you want. But probably you're fine. And yeah, it won't look weird at all if we actually just start with you like properly centered on an index kind of thing and do something like that. Okay, so now we can navigate this. And again, we're doing this in a way that doesn't need, like a bunch of this stuff we'd have to put in anyway. The big thing is we're not using any raycast or anything like this, just because we're just looking up the, the target at a particular position like this. We're looking up in the tile map, which is really the, the way it would have been done originally because it's super lightweight. Um, and yeah, we actually, in this here, unless we start adding like particle effects that want to want to have like bounce off the walls or something like that, we don't need to use the Unity Physics engine at all in this particular game. Um, but we might use it for the collisions with the, the, the ghosts slash goalies. Uh, we'll, uh, we'll get there in a second. Let's work on the inputs, okay? We want to be able to control this, not through the inspector like I'm doing here, but through, um, through keys on the keyboard. So um, how do we want to do that? We could, and again, in programming, there's a million different answers to everything, right? It's always tricky when I get a programming question. It's like, well, how do you do this? It's like, well, I don't know. How do you want to do this? What we could do is we could add code in here to read the keyboard inputs. It's very easy to do. However, this maze mover, I want it to be kind of um, generic or agnostic about what it's moving, right? It's not necessarily moving a human player. It may move, be moving some AI stuff. So we don't want the movement code to be in here. We could, we could have a Boolean uh, is player controlled, you know, true or false from the things that you set up. And then you have an if statement somewhere else. Ugh, oh, terrible. So we're left with uh, a couple of other ways that are, are probably the, uh, the more correct approaches. One is we could do a subclass. Now subclassing is actually something that uh, like for me, like when I went and learned object oriented programming way back in the day from, from, from literal dinosaurs, um, literal dinosaurs. Um, I mean, you know, cool, deep subclassing tree, not to mention multi, like multi parented subclassing and things like that. We didn't have this interface shit and everything like that. That was like so neat. And it turns out to be incredibly unwieldy. Your default answer should not be subclassing. And I think some of that might still be a problem for new CS students because you're probably learning something like Java and stuff like that, which is object oriented. And subclassing is awesome. I mean, our maze mover is subclass from mono behavior, which I think is subclass from something else as well. There's a lot of power and potency there. Um, but it should be used very carefully. Instead, one of the big things um, that, that has been developed over, over time and which like Unity is heavily based on, but it's certainly far from the only one, is this sort of component-based design, right? Which is what we're using, we're already using, right? There's a component on this called Maze Mover, and we can add another component to do something else and this and this. So for example, I could have a component called something like Player Mover. All right, we could have another component on here called player mover. And it would interact with the maze mover. For this particular example, I think um, whether we subclass or component the player mover slash um, enemy mover is probably six of one, half a dozen of the other. Um, with If we're doing it as another component with player mover over here, then what we have to make sure to do is add some accessor functions because the player mover, what it wants to do is it wants to change the desired direction. That's literally all. The only question here is how do we get at desired direction? Now, if it's public like this, hey, it's great because I can uh, go into my player mover and player mover can do, you know, get component uh, maze mover dot desired direction equals, you know, something. Hey, easy peasy. We all know that, that publics and things are pretty evil. Um, directly accessing this is pretty bad. We could do it as a property, 
right? So that it could have some sanity checking built in and things like that. But it's probably cleanest instead to have an explicit sort of setter and getter, right? Um, let's go down to the bottom here. Let's say we have a void set desired direction vector to dear and then we'll probably want something that can get it as well vector two get desired direction this returns uh desired direction like that and this is basically i mean it's basically doing this is equal to dear all right and maybe we want to make sure that they're not trying to move us diagonally or something weird like that okay fine now, the thing is, even with this, now, these will have to be, they'll probably be public. Even if we subclass, we probably want this. Yeah, you know, if if we make, um, if we make desired direction over here, we don't want it, let's say we don't want it to be public, which I think is, is a good thing. Uh, we could subclass, in which case we make this protected, so our children class can modify it directly. But I don't even think we want to do that. I think we like the idea of this being explicitly private. Correct me if I'm wrong, in C Sharp, the default permission level is private, right? <laughs> I like that. You could make the player stationary and move the map around the player. That's really funny. It shouldn't be as funny as it is, but it really does make it quite funny. Um, I think we should still have this be private. Because then, um, even if we subclass, we can still do our sanity checks over here. Seems like a good idea. So in the end, I think functionally it doesn't matter one way or the other. The subclassing, we can interact directly. I mean, we could have... Um, we could have uh, our, our update be virtual so that our, our player mover, we have our update, we could do an override to override the, de the default update and mess with things. I think it gets too sloppy and messy, even though very logically, in a sense, player mover would be a, a subclass version of maze mover. Um, I think it works way better and way cleaner and keeps things much more separated to just put it as a separate component. So everything that moves around the map will have a maze mover component and some might have a player mover because they care about inputs and some might have an enemy mover because they have some sort of AI. Um, if I could remember, I would put in, um, hang on, unity require component. I don't remember what their special magic tag is for it. There you go. We could say something like, hey, you can only add um, a player mover to something that's got a maze mover. This way, if you put a player mover component on something, it'll automatically add this. Or if you try to remove the maze mover, it'll whine at you. But honestly, what we're going to do in our code here is we're going to want a reference to our own maze mover. And if we forget to have a maze mover component on here, at some point when we go and do some stuff in here, like set desired direction, we'll get an error and it'll be pretty clear what happened. It's not It's not going to be like, this isn't a runtime thing, right? This is just a while you're working the editor thing. So while you're working the editor, you'll also be pretty aware of these errors like this and be like, okay, my, my prefab for my, my goalie, my ghost doesn't have the component on it. So you fix it and it takes two seconds, you're just done. So... I often don't see a lot of need to do this. It's kind of convenient to like put a component on something and have the other components put in, but we're not building like a sort of a library function that needs that kind of stuff. So anyway, you can put it in if you want, leave it out. Really will make no difference to what the heck's going on here. So our player mover, what we're going to do in update, and update is where you want to check, um, check inputs. Even if you were using a fixed update for the movement, uh, this is not an interface. This is a, what do you call this? It's like a, it's like a meta command. It's an attribute, I guess, but it's, it's something that's like not, it's read by just like the unity IDE to automatically do some things. And I don't even know if it does anything at a, at a compiler level. I don't know if the compiler gives a shit about this at all. Someone, someone smarter than me would have to answer that. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, the doc t talks about it as an attribute, but it's one of those things where, like, the, the specific um, uh, terminology certainly escapes me. Okay, so I was going to say, even if you're doing your movement in a fixed update, you want to capture your inputs in an update. There's an exception to it. So how do you capture inputs? Well, you can do input.getKey. Um, what is it? Key code? 
dot uh, a, for example, right? Or or left. I have to be reminded what these are. Is it all capitalized? I guess I'll just see if there's a compilation error or not. I'm sorry, I really should have fixed the autocomplete before we went in. It might be a two-second thing, but I don't know. Uh, it doesn't look... Is it all caps? No. Damn it. Oh, left arrow. Okay, there we go. So, um, there are... Okay, so there's get key. There's get key down. And get key up. And you're going to use these in subtly different ways. Returns true every frame while the key is held down. Returns true only on the first frame the key was pressed down. And this returns true only on the first frame the key was released. And here's one of the key differences with the, the update. In fixed update, in fixed update, this works fine. Because all it does is check, hey, is the arrow key being held down right now? Um, but da -da -da. Ooh, hold on. Hey, hey, H2RG, thank you very much. And there's some good questions in chat I want to get to. Uh, just says, cheers, Quill. H2RG. I want to figure out what that reference is, and I can't. <laughs> Part of me keeps thinking, it's like, oh, Hitchhiker's Guy. No, wait, that doesn't work at all. <laughs> uh, so thank you very much for the support. Yeah, I might want to try to just restart the editor. That might do it. Uh, but I thought, no, we started with a fresh, a fresh go. I suppose I could close it and reopen it and we'll see. You know what? Here, let's just give it a little go and see what, what happens. Oh, you work at Unity as an engineer. I was wondering, um, uh, I don't know how you want me to say your, your first name. Is it just, it was probably just like Dyke, Jike, Yike. I apologize. Dev, Mr. Dev. Um, uh, yeah, I was wondering, because you were answering a lot of questions there, which is really cool. So required component was also used at runtime recently uh, when you do a game object add component. Oh, interesting. Ah. Uh -huh. um, there was another question. How includes a list of attributes you get with reflection? Oh, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Bump, bump, bump. Okay. Um, so in here, and yeah, he might correct me for some things, he or she. Um, this works fine in fixed update because you're just checking the current status. Is this key currently up or down? True or false? But these will sometimes work in fixed update and sometimes won't because it only checks the first, it's the first sort of visual frame for lack of a, of a better phrase here, right? Update is what runs on every like refresh of your screen. Whereas fixed update only runs on every tick of the physics engine. Sometimes the two line up and sometimes they don't. So if you're doing the get key up or down inside a fixed update, sometimes it will miss the down or miss the up. You can use this, but it's often a better thing, uh, just as a, a force of habit to prevent you from accidentally falling into another thing. Check your inputs and update, and then maybe do something like bool, you know, um, left was clicked equals false, something like this, right? And then, whoops. And then in your update, you do something like left was click equal true. And then in your fixed update, you do something like if left was clicked, do the thing left was click equals false. Depending on exactly what you're trying to do. And then this is moot here because we're not using the physics system to move anything. But there'll be one day you're going to try to do something and you'll run into some sort of like unbelievably hard to like figure out bug because you you did you check and get key up and down inside of a fixed update. Unless things have changed, which is entirely possible because Unity is very much a moving target. OK, um, so what we're going to do here in the player move is we're just checking to see if the player keys we're putting. Now we can do get key. The other thing we can do is um, input dot get access. Potentially raw, depending on, um, in this case, because, um, okay, 
Get axis is specifically think about a joystick. You're going to be asking for either the horizontal or the vertical axis of the joystick. And um, that is mapped to the arrow keys by default inside of Unity. Very convenient. So you can ask for the vertical and horizontal axis. It'll work with the arrow keys. It'll work with WASD and it'll work with a joystick or control pad or something. Um, get axis will get the difference between raw and axis. Okay. So get axis raw will properly tell you the current value of the joystick position. Get access, as opposed to get access raw, will also do the same thing basically for a joystick. The difference comes with key presses because in Unity, when you set up your unit, your, your inputs in Unity, uh, project settings, inputs, they're still here, right? And your axes here, so for horizontal. What you can do is you can specify a sensitivity and a gravity. And this determines how quickly the, when you hit say the left arrow key, how quickly the leftness of your horizontal axis goes from zero to one. Okay, and then when you release the arrow key, how quickly it goes from one back down to zero. Has a little bit of a lag in there to simulate the fact that if you're using an actual physical joystick, you can go just a little left, slightly more left, all the way left. Obviously, there's no slightly pressing on the left arrow key. So by having a little bit of a kind of a delay in there, it can kind of simulate that. Um, in our game, really, we don't want that sort of gradual access stuff. We want it to go like instantly register. So there's two ways we could do it. We could change these numbers to be like, you know, you know uh, infinite gravity kind of thing um, so that it basically snaps instantly. Or we can just read the raw inputs, get access raw, which will return the true value, ignoring the gravity and sensitivity. Um, if we're using get access raw, effectively, these two will be the same. The difference is here we are uh, getting the uh, the hard coded in left arrow key. We could also do this instead of hard coding in the key code for left arrow. We could say something like get button, and this would be a name, so left, um, and then that would be something else we define in the uh, the inputs these axes. So we could create an axis called left, um, and then this could be this can be tuned to a particular you know. Uh, value we could you know set up preferences and things like that um, so that people can remap their hotkeys and all kinds of things. I think in our situation, I think what we want to do is probably the get access raw horizontal. I'm assuming minus one to plus one is still the range here. Back. Are you using the new input system? Lie. It's so much fun and really easy to get working. And lie. Uh, we're just going to use this for this because it's going to be fine. But yeah, I haven't actually messed with the, uh, the new input system too much. Um, from minus one to plus one uh, based on left, right input. Mm -hmm. um, so Let's set up a new vector two called uh, new deer, um, which I'll initialize to vector two dot zero over here. So it'll just be a zero zero vector. So here, um, well, we don't really need an if at all, actually. Hang on. If we're doing it this way, what I can do is vector two new deer is equal to new vector two. Ooh, I just got hungry. Um, that's what I get for not doing eating lunch before these streams. It's uh, two thirty, nearly two thirty in the afternoon, getting a little peckish. Um, and then we can do something like input dot get access raw. It's raw, and other Gordon Ramsay isms, and vertical. Now, now I have something in here. This isn't quite right right now. Put some food in your face hole. Actually, I really need to pee too. So wait, I probably do on a break. We're coming to 30. We're going to go for probably about, uh, we'll finish at least what we're doing here. Maybe another 15, 20 minutes, half an hour. And then we're going to switch to a multiplayer factorial in a second. Um, but uh, I want to do that. And then, and then I'll pee and I might be able to get a snack too. I don't know. I'll get, I'll get a cookie. Um, so the problem here is new deer could be really wonky at this point you know could be diagonal uh could have a fractional 
number or decimal number like you know it could be 0 0.67 comma 0 or negative 0 0.24 or something really weird like that we don't want that so how do we want to sanitize this well first okay we don't want diagonals right so if there's a horizontal component and a vertical component we want to drop one of those um, and then the other thing we want to do is we probably want to sanitize it to um well, we want to set its magnitude to one afterwards. We want it to be a length one vector in some direction. Uh, so mostly the important thing is we have to drop one of the two parts. What I propose is let's pick one of the sides to favor. If there's both a horizontal and a vertical movement, let's, let's only use the horizontal. Right? So if you're holding diagonal, you'll only go left and right instead of up and down. Sure, why not? Um, what I'm going to suggest is something like this. If the absolute value, so ABS, so we're going to ignore the negative part, right? If the absolute value of the X direction is larger than, larger or equal to, than the absolute value of the Y direction, then what we're going to do is we're going to drop the Y. Uh, we have, uh, well, in case, in case we have both an X and a Y, X is bigger, so zero the Y, and else, it's probably another way to do this, but I don't know, else we're going to zero out the X, and then what we're going to do is we're going to set the desired direction, the new direction. New direction sounds dirty, <laughs> depending on how you parse it, uh, to normalized. So this is going to end up being negative 1, 0, plus 1, 0, or 0, 1, 0. Um, what happens if there's no inputs? I think this will work out fine. Does it, it, will any of this throw an error? If, uh, if new direction... Sounds, still sounds dirty. If new direction is a zero length vector, what happens when you do normalize on it in Unity? I don't know. We might want to ignore small values. Huh. New direction is the group that formed after one direction broke up. New direction is also the name of the, uh, the Glee Club in Glee. Yeah, I actually don't know, and we might not want to just trust it, because there this could be, you know, some weird undefined stuff or something like that. Let's say something like if new direction dot um, magnitude pop pop. Well, let's again we'll use the square because it's a little faster. Again, this is not the actual length, but if it's quite small, if it's less than zero point you know, one or you know, really small. The input is really small, probably zero. So, so we don't do anything. Because in Pac-Man, you don't have to hold the direction. When Pac-Man, or Puck-Man, the Zamboni driver in this case, is moving in the direction, if you're not hitting anything, he should just keep moving that direction, right? So we just return. Does this sound right? Oh, you get an N. Excellent. Oh, well, we've got, we've got some conflicts here. Every question says, keeps the zero vector of zero when normalizing. Uh, and uh, the dev says you get a, uh, an N. In any case, we're going to avoid this. The, if we get to this point, the vector should not be zero. It should not be small in any way. Well, in fact, it should be, um, yeah. It should only have one number, and it should be a meaningful number. <laughs> this is conflict in Twitch chat over anything? No, never. Um, and some of it might be some, you know, some things change, right? Some of the behavior. So yeah, we'll explicitly check. If it's really small, we don't want to change any direction. Can we move our dude now?
Hey, while we have a dev in the chat, what's the uh, what's the cleanest way for us to to enable the pixel perfect thing, which I know isn't even thing, to uh, avoid any of the um, the weird artifacting with the little green graphic that can happen at certain zoom levels here that we've got on the graphics, which of course isn't showing up consistently now. It really depends on exactly uh, the size of things. See, there we go. Because so we have a little bit of a green border around these graphics. What's the the most appropriate setting? We have our filtering set to just no filtering or point filtering. Um, we don't even have compression turned on. Um, is it a camera setting? There's there's a pixel perfect option some, or am I thinking in the the UI? Normalized in zero vector will shoot plenty of warnings in the console. Excellent. We're uh, we're not using yeah we're not messing with uh, with the, the rendering pipeline too much because it's you know we're doing very very beginner friendly kind of tutorial here. But I like our movement here. One of the things to consider. I don't think it matters for us. Oh, actually, oh it does buffer it. Of course it. Yeah, that's interesting. I can hit. Oh. Right. Okay, that's interesting. If I'm moving left here, if I hit now, oh, not quite there. If I hit it before I come in, it'll still take it because it sets the new direction. But here, if I hit up, it does set the direction up, but it's not legal. So it stops our movement, but it doesn't remember the old thing. Hmm. What we probably want for this, don't chew in your hair elastic. What are you doing? What we probably want here, right? The sanity checks. Um, make sure not diagonal, diagonal. Um, in theory, <laughs> our player mover enemy. I think my Y key on my keyboard's a little sticky. Um, script already does this but we shouldn't accept a direction that would slam us into a wall now we already make sure we don't move into a wall but right now it's stopping us bum, bum, bum. just trying to no pixel perfect except you you so i think the thing to do is to um is to scale the orthographic projection to be correct for the amount of um, tiles we want to show, right? So that it's an exact amount of pixels, top and bottom, or, or smooth multiplier. I feel like there's something. Possibly the, the solution in this case would be to clean up our tile map, this one that I grabbed, so it doesn't have these uh, green lines. And honestly, that would probably, like, that would probably 100% fix it. Um, but I was just curious that these green lines are just because it's picking up the extra green pixels over here at certain zoom levels because it's not you know it's surrounding error when trying to pick this up um i mean maybe a little bit of a border too but then we'd cut this off i think it's just that the uh, the one tile set that we're using we just i would just go into photoshop i would just go and like eyedropper the green and just rip it all out and then call that done although that would work here because we would be left with a gap between the graphics but in terms of say these sprites here if there was no graph up, um gap at all and they were touching we would still get those weird sort of aliasing issues where it would sometimes grab like from the stone texture over here it would grab a little bit of green from that so i mean i guess the solution is to leave a gap between your stuff um but no no then, then we would still get a little blank gap right over here that's right even if we didn't have the green what we'd have is this little bit of a space where you could see the background all of a sudden so i think it might be more to do with some of these zoom levels here and making sure that it's the right multiplier and things, but worry about that some other day. It's not anti-tropic filtering because I have that delayed uh, disabled over here. I mean, you don't want repeat because that wouldn't do the right thing either. No, no. I mean, clamp is definitely right. Point no filter is definitely right. I'm not sure. It's at the GPU level texture sampled. Yeah, depending on distance camera, so you can't avoid it really. But I mean, It's not pixels per unit, although you can avoid the issue, again, except in certain edge cases, if this were just higher res and there would be more pixels to properly sample from. But it's one of those things, if you if you Google, you'll see this issue comes up. And it's not just a Unity thing. It's all game dev, period, trying to do tiles thing. If, um, if the tiles, because what's happening is the tiles aren't an exact 
pixel boundary, right? We need like one-to-one -one pixel ratios with what's happening on screen, in which case to do that, you need, you know, it would be really tiny. There's like, you know, so that this is actually 20 pixels on the screen, which doesn't last if you change this. So it's a combination of both those things. So I think usually what I see is the fix is often to try to take a look at, at what program startup, you actually get the actual size of your viewport and adjust your orthographic projection to be, um, to hit proper pixel values. A little fiddly for what I think our scope over here. I don't know if the extrude edges matter because I think that's just the, um, that's just the mesh for the physics, right? I actually don't know. No, so you can still see the, uh, the green artifacting in there. Yeah, I think that's just for, um, I think that might just be for some of the meshing. I'm not certain. I might be lying to you. Okay, let's do this last fix, and then I'm desperately going to go pee, and we're going to start some factorial. So yeah, we don't want to accept a direction that would slam us into the wall. So really what we want to do is simply, um, where we do a check here for the tile, You know this right over here? Mm, let me do is, yeah. Right over here where we fix this. Uh, no, maybe not. Um, to, um, position to normalize position. I don't know what I want to call this. I mean, normalize doesn't actually make sense. Um, floor position, maybe. Floor vector, because uh, what I want to do is, because we're going to use this more than once. I'm still not convinced. The fact that I've got so much flavor text over here, <laughs> flavor text, uh, means I'm not entirely pleased with it. Um, it's working for now, but I've, I feel like there's a more robust solution. Uh, so over here, um, uh, vector to possible, I don't know, test pause. Um, it's the same as what we're doing with the target position over here, right? Yeah. So this is our target position plus the new desired position. So if this is equal to false, um, trying to move into a wall, ignore input. Or we can still buffer it and do different things, but for now this is going to be probably all right. I was going to say, yeah, there's going to be some uh, some conversions here. I don't know, I guess we can just about six one half another. I could do some casting and things, but maybe I'll just do it this way. Try this. Okay. So now it no longer stops me if I'm trying to move directly into this, which is fine. Now, it doesn't always respond right away to the inputs. And the reason for that is we don't refresh the target destination as soon as we get an input. Right? We only change the target tile that we're trying to slide into once we've arrived at the last tile. So as we're sliding, if I hit the button, it doesn't change directions instantly. What?
I did a thing that stopped us completely. That's interesting. Really some bugs. Probably what we want to do is once we've gotten here, we've confirmed that there's a new desired direction. I think what we want to do is we want to um, force an update of our target here. If force is equal to false. So normally, we only actually update if we've reached our target position. But with force, we want to update our, our target immediately. So that it snaps from side to side. Even before we've arrived at our destination. There you go. Super responsive now. And I think that's probably the way we want it to work. Oh. That's weird. Oh! I'm gonna use our current position here. I was trying to apply, I was testing here based on our target position than that, but we wanna look at our current position. Oh, it still lets us clip some edges a little. Oh, yeah, because of the overshoot. That makes sense. Um, hmm. What did I call that? Because I didn't call it normalized. I called it um, floor position. Floor current position. This might still not be correct. I'm, I'm admittedly, I'm rushing because I'm trying to finish things. Uh, because of time and also because I desperately need to pee. So I'm sort of doing the equivalent of just throwing stuff at a wall and see what's sticking and not really thinking it through there. Oh, yeah, um, there's still going to be a little bit of clipping because where it's clipping. Hmm. How do I want to do that? That makes sense because we're actually just over the boundary here. So it's okay. When I'm here, what's happening is, pause it there. When I'm here and I floor the position, it's counting me as being in this tile. So it's say, yeah, it's totally okay for you to go straight up. How do we make it so it responds instantly when we're going left and right, but doesn't do that there? Do we even need... No, we need... Okay. So we need this for left and right. So that we can do this. Or so it doesn't lag like it does now. Because, yeah. Yeah, then it'll still sort of stop from time to time. I think we still want this. I think we need to... We, this needs to be tweaked slightly. Do we just... If we just offset it by half a, um, a world unit... Would that do what we want? It probably does, but it feels fiddly, and therefore I'm sort of not liking it on principle. But out of curiosity, again, this is this is this is pea brain happening right now, where I'm just like, ah, I gotta do whatever. Yeah, it still sort of clips a little. Yeah. All right, I should probably just go pee. So if I get rid of this um yeah and get rid of this this is the unresponsive but oh yeah but it still stalls us into a wall um which is gonna have to be okay for now so i can stop myself by hitting up here or down which we clearly don't want i'll have to find a, a more proper way of doing this when I don't have full pea brain. Please work, I have to pee. Exactly, there's the code. 
138 again. Uh, calling floor position twice probably doesn't do anything. Um, you're probably right. Yeah, so it's coming out to basically the same. Um, we want to get rid of one of them for sure. Uh-huh. Yeah, maybe that's the best solution. Only force updated vectors reverse the current direction. Okay, 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 okay. We still want to do... We still have to check this to prevent... Okay, so this first thing is... If we're selecting a direction that would slam us into a wall, um, this will cause us to stop, which doesn't feel right. Puckman should never stop. Well, unless he slams into a wall, but like, Going, you know, if we're moving horizontally and we hit up into a wall and it stops us, I don't think Pac-Man's supposed to do that. So, our first check is to not accept a direction input that would predict us moving into a wall. And it actually can be a prediction. So we actually can go back to my first um, thing, which is target position plus new direction. So this will eat the input and ignore it if we'd be moving into a wall. Now, this works correctly. If I hit up, nothing's happening. If I hold up, then it'll move me up at the appropriate time. The only issue is the back and forth being sort of slow and laggy. So probably, yeah, um, if the input is to reverse our direction, do it instantly. Well, let's test it and see what it does. Um, so, let me just save this. One second. Uh, vector2 old dear is equal to this. Save that. Um, Yeah, that's probably what we need to do. I'm going to put it to do. To do. We'll do some calculation uh, and then flip the direction instantly if it's just a reversal, which I think is what we want. And we'll, we'll just have to check to make sure, like, if I hit right and then left, it doesn't let me, like, slam through the wall or clip through the wall or anything weird like that. Uh, it should be pretty easy, but my, my pea brain has reached maximum capacity at this point. So we are wrapping up this tutorial at this point. We are going to continue this um, next stream. In fact, there's a possibility. Stay tuned. It'll depend on how I feel. We might continue it as a bonus stream tomorrow uh, with the programming. Um, otherwise, it might be it might be on Monday or it might be next Saturday. Just stay tuned. Uh, watch Twitter. Watch Discord. Um, for announcements as to when this will be continued. We'll fix that. It's it's going to be a two-minute fix as soon as I can actually use my brain for something other than um, controlling my bladder. And uh, otherwise, stay at the stream. We're going to be doing some multiplayer factorio um, is what we're going to flip over. Uh, I will be pushing this to Git, absolutely. Um, and uh, so you'll be able to download the code that we have to date. Um, so, yeah. Let me take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to switch to some factorial multiplayer. Actually, hold on. We're going to take a short break. You guys can ask some questions in chat. I will try to answer them, then we'll move to factorial multiplayer. So be right back.